that this election has already been lost and that it's about damage limitation. And it is really important because it's the difference between whether, if, you know, if Labour win a slim majority, then the fight is on for the next election. I know it seems silly to look five years ahead, but it does make a difference, mm. versus basically accepting that we have 10 years of Labour government ahead. Having an acknowledgement that the Tories are going to lose and lose badly, mm. um, disastrously, maybe, um, having that acknowledgement coming from somebody so senior is very demoralising for everybody else in the party, but also doesn't it make it then look rather immoral for them to just drag on right through to maybe November? Personally, I think Rishi Sunak should name the date now. I think he should name it for October or November. In terms of reform, if they're only four points behind the Conservatives in the latest poll, do we need to stop the narrative, which we have been using legitimately, saying, well, they're, they're, yeah, they're doing all right in the polls, but they won't win any seats? Do we need to change that perspective now? I think it's really difficult to say. It depends on reform's electoral strategy. There's a lot of evidence that in certain parts of the country with certain demographics, they do have a really good chance. So I think if they target seats in the red wall and other places where there's big disillusionment with the Conservatives and what they promised, I can't imagine that reform are at the stage where they could take uh, masses of seats. It's more about that portion of the vote that they'll be taking away that I think is going to result in that massive Labour landslide. Good afternoon, Britain. It's 12 o'clock on Thursday, the 4th of April. The nuclear option, Rishi Sunak has said he's prepared to withdraw from the European Convention on Human Rights if that's what it takes to stop the votes. Last night, he said controlling illegal immigration is more important than any foreign court. Do you believe him? Two-tier justice. British judges have been told to consider softening sentences for criminals if they happen to come from deprived or difficult backgrounds. Should poorer people spend less time behind bars? And Falkland's threat, the new maverick president of Argentina, has announced his roadmap to seize control of the British Overseas Territory. How worried should we be? Now, this, uh, this phrase from Rishi Sunak, mm. perhaps going further than he ever has yeah. before, saying he's prepared, potentially, to withdraw from the ECHR. It seems, like, it seems as though, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems as though every Conservative uh, leader has flirted with this idea. They've suggested they would if they needed to, and, you know, if they can't get various... If they can't get illegal immigration, essentially, is what it usually comes down to, or the deportation of foreign criminals mm. and things like that, they always say, oh, yes, I would consider it, we would do it if we need to. Well, surely... They haven't stopped the boat, so do they need to? Is this the moment? Well, there is one Prime Minister of the last five who actually has stood up to the ECHR and told them to get lost with one of their rulings. That was David Cameron. Yeah. Uh, he didn't withdraw. He didn't say that he wanted to withdraw. The last three Prime Ministers have flirted with the option, I'd say. But David Cameron, uh, on the issue of prisoner voting, got together a coalition of, of members of parliament, expressed the will of parliament, saying, actually, we don't want this, and told the ECHR where to go. So, I mean, perhaps, perhaps there's a route through there if there's a courageous prime minister. But, uh, as Rishi Sunak said, his phrase was that he would always prioritise controlling migration above any foreign courts. Well, it's clearly not true, is it, so far? I mean, we've allowed the European Court of Human Rights to prevent the deportation of crim criminals to stop illegal immigration in some respects. So, clearly, he's got to prove it. But, of course, this comes in the context of uh, the Reform Party. Rising in the polls now at 13, 14 points. And an enormous poll that came out just last night showing the Tories are going to lose uh, in a worse way than John Major did against Tony Blair. So, could they do something yes. drastic Let to us turn know. things around? Is Rishi Sunak all words and no trousers? Do you think he could possibly take us out of the ECHR, should he? Let us know, gbviews at gbnews.com. But it's your headlines with Sam.
Tom and Emily, thank you very much. And good afternoon from the newsroom. Three minutes past 12. And as we heard from Tom and Emily, the Prime Minister says that Britain could pull out of the European Convention on Human Rights if it obstructs the government's Rwanda plan. Rishi Sunak says controlling illegal migration is more important than membership to the ECHR and he would not let what he called the foreign court interfere in sovereign matters. Labour, though, has accused the Prime Minister of trying to appease the hard right of the Conservative Party. More than 600 British legal experts, including three former Supreme Court judges, are calling on the UK to stop sending arms to Israel. They say there is a plausible risk the weapons may be used to commit serious violations of international law and that the Prime Minister must change Britain's policy. Shadow Business Secretary Jonathan Reynolds told GB News this morning that the government should publish the legal advice it's received on the UK's arrangement with Israel. The law of the UK is very, very clear. If there is any possibility of anything exported from the UK being involved in a serious violation of, of humanitarian law, it cannot be exported from the UK. So the government will have had legal advice on that specific to the conflict in Gaza. We've asked them to publish that legal advice. It would be, I think, a reasonable step, given what, what has happened in the last few days and what has happened over the last few months, to make clear the legal position and to make sure the government itself and we are currently complying with UK law. Meanwhile, the United Nations has put its missions in Gaza on hold while the charities uh, review their humanitarian work there. It's after seven aid workers were killed by an Israeli airstrike on Monday. They were part of a group from the World Central Kitchen organisation whose vehicles were hit while travelling on an approved humanitarian route. Among them were three British nationals, John Chapman, James Henderson and James Kirby. The charity's founder has now accused Israeli forces of targeting its workers, he says, systematically, car by car. Foreign editor of Jewish News, Yotam Confino, told GB News that a full investigation must be allowed to take place. Whether this was systematic and, and deliberate, actually going after these aid workers, I think that remains to be seen until the Israel can really um, present some of its investigation fully to the world. But it makes no sense for Israel to target this organization because not only is it working closely with this organization, it's actually helping them distribute the food that they deliver from Cyprus. In other news, British farmers are calling on a, for a guaranteed basic income after post-Brexit arrangements left many worse off. At least 100 have joined a campaign group urging the government to help cover basic costs after the loss of subsidies from the European Union. Analysis last year by the organic farming group Riverford found that half of Britain's fruit and vegetable growers may go out of business within just a year. It comes as suppliers are warning of higher prices on the, the supermarket shelves due to a new post-Brexit border charge, which will be introduced at the end of this month. Judges have been told to consider more lenient sentences for offenders from deprived or from difficult backgrounds. The Sentencing Council, which sets guidelines for judges and magistrates, has for the first time outlined mitigating factors that it says courts should consider before handing down a sentence. Those factors include poverty, low education, discrimination and insecure housing. Justice Secretary Alex Chalk says the recommendations are patronising and inaccurate. Weather news and strong winds and heavy rain will hit part of Britain this weekend as Storm Kathleen rolls in. Gusts of up to 70 miles an hour are expected on Saturday along the west coast of England. With 50 mile an hour winds also expected in other areas, the Met Office is urging people to take care as coastal areas can also expect to see large waves. And dozens of people are still missing and now 10 people are known to have died after a major earthquake in Taiwan. People have been urged to keep clear of mountainous areas due to the risk of falling rocks since that quake. More than 1,000 people have suffered injuries, with nervous residents expecting more than 300 aftershocks. However, emergency workers have been commended for their quick response, with some shelters in operation within just two hours of that major quake. And finally, if you thought that adjusting to daylight saving time was hard, well, how about lunar time? The moon is to get its own time zone in an effort to provide a coordinated benchmark for spacecraft and for satellites. But it's not quite as simple as readjusting your watch, with the moon's differing gravitational force affecting how time unfolds relative to how we perceive it here on Earth. 
For those planning a trip to space, NASA is hoping to develop its new lunar time by the end of 2026. For the latest stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan the code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. It's 12.08. Now, controlling illegal migration is more important than our membership of any foreign court. That's according to Rishi Sunak, apparently, who gave maybe his strongest hint yet that he's willing to rip up the UK's international obligations to get Rwanda flights off the ground. Well, speaking to The Sun last night, the Prime Minister said that illegal migration offended his sense of fairness, adding that the Rwanda scheme was fundamental for our sovereignty. Hmm, well, let's head to Westminster and speak to our political editor, Christopher Hope. Uh, Christopher, why do you suspect Rishi Sunak has said this? Well, hi, Tom. Hi, Emily. Well, I think, look at who he's speaking to. He's speaking to the audience of, of The Sun. Uh, they want to hear, as our viewers do at GB News and our listeners, action on the small boats crisis. I mean, this is the PM who called it an emergency, emergency legislation required last November, and yet still, four months later, is not on the statute books. Now, we, we know, or we think, we, we've been told by very senior government sources that we are going to see this bill uh, made law on the April the 18th, after two more spats with, with um, the House of Lords. And you're seeing there on the screen now, Rishi Sunak uh, announcing his plan to stop the boats. The question uh, from Harry Cole, the Sun's political editor, was uh, why you say stop the boats? Why not say cut numbers of crossings or something else? But he made very clear he wants to stop the boats. But the language is so interesting. He said there, didn't he, I believe that border security and making sure that we can control illegal migration is more important than membership of a foreign court because it's fundamental to our sovereignty as a country. Um, he's not saying he's going to leave the ECHR, but he's, he's showing clearly he thinks that judges in Strasbourg, which prevent flights taking off because of the human rights of those being flown to Rwanda, that shouldn't get in the way of flights. Now, I've gone to Downing Street today and said, what does that really mean? And what we're told by Number 10 is he's saying that if it came to it and the European Convention of Human Rights was a block on Rwanda, we would consider leaving. So you're hearing, but both of you are very good at this kind of thing, two conditional tenses there on a mm -hmm. commitment to leave the ECHR. That hasn't stopped, of course, Tom and Emily, other right-wingers leaping on the language uh, and almost trying to push Number 10 into a position of saying well, we will leave the ECHR if Strasbourg gets in the way of these flights taking off. Jonathan Gullis, now Deputy Chairman of the party, on Twitter last night, he wrote that Britain will quit the ECHR if that is what it takes to stop the boats, Sunak tells Sun readers. He didn't quite say that, did he? No, it's, <laughs> it's interesting because... <laughs> This is further than Rishi Sunak has gone before in terms of outright rhetoric. But he has for some time been saying that he would be willing to, for example, ignore the pyjama injunctions that were placed on the United Kingdom by the uh, ECHR that stopped that initial plane getting off. He has tiptoed around this area for quite some time. Yeah. He's used that term foreign courts in an interview that uh, I did for GB News in Kent on that very cold day in Kent. He talked about foreign courts and that annoys people uh, on social media. They think that because the UK has signed up to the Strasbourg Court, it's part of our jurisprudence as much as other countries. But he means foreign courts is literally a court based in Strasbourg. That's right, Tom. Number 10 also said that he was answering a question hypothetically about these potential pyjama mm. junctions. And what that means is the government is clearly gearing itself up for a big legal fight in the courts. Once the Rwanda Act becomes law, as Number 10 and others think it will do after April the 18th, once that happens, then it will go to the courts to decide that if that law is watertight and can prevent um, uh, European human rights law stopping fl flights taking off. So we are nowhere near these flights taking off, but we are getting towards the end of this interminable parliamentary process. Yes, and Chris, just quickly, could this also have something to do with this uh, latest polling? from YouGov that uh, suggests Rishi Sunak is heading for a worse result than John Major's 1997 result. 
That, that's right, Emily. It's a mass poll, an MRP polling. Now, this MRP polling famously got the 2017 uh, election result right with YouGov. Um, it was also many... This is a detailed polling, seat by seat, showing that the Tories will win just 155 seats, down from 365 now um, that they won in the 2019 general election. It further supports the idea the party is on the course for an absolute drubbing. Um, the Tory party, for its, its part, or the number 10, certainly, and its strategists are looking and hoping they can make sure that they can get n n uh, people non-committed uh, to vote this time round who did vote Tory last time. That can claw back and eat into uh, that election uh, result that, that looks like it's on its way from the polling. Um, for me, though, I think this party is fighting to, to stay in the game, frankly after the election, because it's all about holding and being able to fight against the mm. Labour, Labour government in 2029. Well, thank you very much indeed, Christopher Hope there, our political editor, live from Westminster. No, it's interesting that Chris brought up this idea of, of the criticism of the phrase, the quite factual phrase, that the UCHR is a foreign court. Yes. It reminded me of a written question in the House of Commons only a few weeks ago. There's a, an SNP MP uh, by the name of Patrick Grady. He put in a formal written question to the Prime Minister asking, for what reason does the Prime Minister consider the ECHR to be a foreign court? Now, normally, these written questions have very long and ornate answers. They're for he more detailed He said, because it's policy. in Strasbourg. He literally wrote, it's, it's there because it's based in Strasbourg. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, a foreign court, people will try to say, oh, saying a foreign court is some kind of dog whistle. Anyway, let's get the thoughts of former MEP Bill Etheridge. Uh, Bill, uh, Rishi Sunak talking tough-ish. Should we believe him? No. Absolutely not. Uh, it's an election year. Every election year, the Tories start saying things that they think people want to hear. It's been going on now for is it 14 years. Every election, they suddenly become very conservative, very right-wing. It's absolute rubbish. He has no intention whatsoever of leaving the ECHR, which we should have left, incidentally, years ago. And the whole Rwanda scheme is nothing but a great big gimmick to try and look tough. If he really wanted to stop the boats, he should be taking action in the channel, not spending millions on legal cases and flying people to deepest Africa for some bizarre reason when they've come from France. But, Bill, clearly what the Prime Minister says here is that last year, arrivals were down by a third. Why was that? Mainly because of a deal with Albania, whereby we could send people back to Albania. The Albanians stopped coming. They went from the most common uh, kind of person coming across the channel to basically negligible in the statistics. The problem is, with lots of other countries, we don't have a place to send them back to. So the idea of Rwanda is you copy the Albanian model, but apply it to all countries with a safe third country. Surely, based on the evidence of last year and the success of the Albanian returns agreement, this could work? No, it was never going to work, and they never intended to apply it. This is pure Tory spin. And, and the whole idea that most of these people, let's remember, they're coming on boats, small boats across the Channel. It's really obvious where we send them back to. We send them back to France. I've been to the camps. Uh, I, I visited there and I, I spoke to some of the people at the camps a few years ago. They believe that they're going to come to this country with a land of milk and honey, everything's going to be great, and that there's no problem. We need to make it very clear that actually, if you enter our country illegally, there's a major problem. And not only will you be dropped straight back to where you've come from, but I'd like to see the boats that came in scuttled and uh, a, a real mm. point made to the people traffickers and the gangsters who were involved in making all this happen. Well, thank you very much indeed, Bill Etheridge, former MEP. What we do know for certain is that we are seeing record numbers crossing the channel still, mm. and that uh, time is running out um, for Rishi Sunak to make something happen. Yes, and uh, that election does seem, although we don't know the date, to tick closer and closer. But... Uh, from one mess to another, campaigners are now calling for a blue flag status to protect Britain's filthiest rivers 
from pollution. Yes, Liberal Democrat leader Sir Ed Davies says sewage spills are an environmental scandal which Conservative ministers are letting water companies get away with. Well, uh, Yorkshire is home to a huge four out of ten of the country's worst rivers for sewage dumping. Oh, oh no. gosh, Yorkshire. Poor Yorkshire. Joining Poor us. County. <laughs> yes. Well, joining us now from one of those very rivers, the River Wharf, is our Yorkshire and Humber reporter, Anna Riley. Anna, tell me, this is one of the top ten dirtiest rivers. Good afternoon to you both. Yes, it is. I'm here in Weatherby next to the River Wharf. Uh, it is on that top ten list, actually. Four out of ten of those um, filthiest rivers in England, uh, that data gathered by the Liberal Democrats. Top of that list is the River Calder. Uh, that had 4,200 spillages last year, uh, and that amounted to 33 hours of overspill of sewage into the river. Uh, that was followed by the River Avon on the list and then that was followed by number three, uh, the River Severn. Now I have actually took my cup here uh, and put it in the river water just to show you how it looks here against the, the white background. You know, uh, river water is sometimes brown and, and discoloured. There's nothing too unsightly floating in here, <laughs> but you, you can see the, the discoloration there. And this is what the Lib Dems are talking about in terms of that blue flag status. They say uh, for the safety of swimmers and people swim here, people fish here, uh, people paddle, it's a picnic site. Um, as rivers are across England, uh, they're saying that blue, blue flag status would mean that swimmers know when they go to rivers like this that they are protected, that the sewage will not be overspilling into these particular rivers, and that if they are, the water companies will face heavy fines for doing that. Of course, uh, consuming water that is contaminated uh, can be very bad for us. It can lead to gastrointestinal problems, stomach bugs, vomiting, diarrhea. It can hospitalise people it can give you eye infections ear infections respiratory infections so it's it's certainly something that we do not want to be swimming in and consuming um, in terms of what Yorkshire Water have said they have been investing in the sewage system they said by April 2025 next year they'll have invested 180 million pounds to try and update the sewer system but they have attributed uh, the large amount of rivers with sewage problems in Yorkshire to the number of storms last year. There were 11 named storms which caused heavy rainfall and in circumstances where there is heavy rainfall because we've got a combined sewage system for our rainwater, rainwater and wastewater through one, companies can overflow into rivers and seas with sewage when that happens. The problem is when companies are doing it when it's dry um, and of course statuses like what the Lib Dems are calling for today uh, is something that certainly get people talking because who wants to swim in filthy river water eh? No it's really really stark when you show it up there for viewers on television seeing that contrast that that dirty dirty water there Anna really thank you for that thank report you. it's uh it's quite shocking really. I hope Anna didn't get her hands dirty after hearing uh, what can happen if you were uh, drink, consume this type of water. Well, I'm sure she's not I'm going sure to take a... I'm sure she's got antibacterial She's not going to take a wash. sip. She's not going to take a sip of I that know. water, that's for sure. I've got, I've got a, a, a drawer full of antibacterial hand wash left over from COVID. I've got, I'm, I'm <laughs> not sure I ever got into that. Should I, I admit kept, to that? I, yeah, I, I got it in my Christmas stocking. I got it in... Oh, there you <laughs> I go. Just, I was just, just... I had so much antibacterial Tom hand wash. I would have been delighted. To delighted to receive some antibacterial <laughs> hand wash for Christmas. <laughs> what a delight. Um, yeah. But this is probably a good campaign for the Liberal Democrats. I mean, they're not polling too highly. This is something that they can do that everyone agrees with. Mm. Everyone agrees that our rivers and water should not be contaminated with sewage as it is. So a good yeah. one for Sir Ed Davey, but, I imagine. But as Anna says, it's ex incredibly expensive to fit this. Unlike lots of countries, we put rainwater storm overflow in the same pipes as the sewage. So it fills up really easily. Not every yeah. country built their system like this, but sadly we did. Well, sadly we did. <laughs> Coming up, the president of our Argentina, a little bit of a maverick, says he will establish a roadmap towards the UK handing over sovereignty of the Falkland Islands. What exactly might this roadmap look like? And does he stand a chance of actually taking the Falkland Islands? This is Good Afternoon Britain. We're on GB News.
I'm Martin Daubney. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Martin Daubney, weekdays from 3 p.m. SUV drivers in Oxford will face higher parking charges, proposals tabled by the local Green Party or passed by the City Council. The motion argues that heavier cars like SUVs cause more damage to roads, are more likely to seriously injure or kill pedestrians and cause more illnesses due to pollution. However, the Alliance of British Drivers has condemned the plan as absolutely outrageous. Well, let's get the thoughts now of the legendary motoring journalist, Quentin Wilson. Quentin, welcome to the show. Always a pleasure. We hear a lot about the war on motorists, this time targeting SUVs because of their weight. And the charges could be astronomical. This idea first started in Paris. Now it's coming to Oxford. Can you tell us a bit about how it would work? OK, so the idea is that the, the, the charges will penalise people who drive heavier SUVs and I guess by implication electric cars, although Oxford Council haven't said exactly what they're going to do with, with EVs. But this is all based around this notion of, of, of SUVs being heavier than passenger cars, therefore wearing out the roads more. Now, there was a study, I've got it here in front of me, from the University of Edinburgh in 2022 that said... Um, Real world tests found that overwhelmingly the wear is caused by large vehicles, buses, heavy good vehicles. Road wear from cars and motorcycles is so low that this is immaterial. Now, obviously, driving around a medieval city like Oxford in an SUV isn't the brightest thing in the world to do. But the idea that we should penalize the owners of these cars based on imperfect science that's been read on social media, I think is completely wrong. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan, Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks, the admission's free. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Well, it's 12.25 and the president of Argentina has reignited the seemingly never-ending row over the Falklands by promising a new roadmap, that's what he calls it, a roadmap for his country's takeover of the islands. Yes, yeah, speaking on the 42nd anniversary of Argentina's invasion of the Falkland Islands, Javier Malay added that the best tribute to Argentina's war dead would be to defend the unwavering claim for Argentinian sovereignty over those islands. However, we've uh, hit back. A spokesman for Prime Minister Rishi Sunak responded, saying the issue had been settled decisively some time ago. And quite decisive <laughs> it was. Let's get the thoughts now of the Falklands War veteran, Simon Weston. Uh, Simon, thank you so much for making the time for us. Uh, how does it make you feel personally when you hear that the uh, Argentine president, the Argentine public, no doubt, simply are not letting this one go? Uh, it's, it's like a dog with a bone. Um, they, they, they lost the argument 42 years ago. They had a referendum several years ago, which was 98 or 97%, something like or 99% uh, in favour of Romanian under British sovereignty. Um, it, it seems to me that with all the problems that this president has in his country with all the raging inflation, which pretty much was what the Argentinians invaded because of uh, 42 years ago, because they had something like 2,000% inflation. Um, it just seems like he's, he's doing the smoke and mirrors trick like mm. a magician. You know, look what the left hand's doing because the right hand's doing something else. 
And, and it just strikes me that he's just he's just banging the same old drum that they've all banged for 42 years. Yes, it does seem that way. But this Javier Malay is a little bit different, isn't he? He's a bit of a maverick. Do you think, actually, he could try and do something about this? He could actually, you know, put his actions where his mouth is. Well, he can't do anything militarily. He's not Superman, you know. His pants go on one leg at a time, same as everybody else. He's not Superman. He's just an ordinary guy who's come from complete left field in Argentinian politics. He is a maverick, but then again, apparently he consults a psychic who talks to his dead dog to get some decisions made. <laughs> um, this, this guy, he has no military to, to talk about. Most of their navy is still where it was left 42 years ago on the bottom of the sea. Um, his air force is depleted, from what I know, from being down there last year. They've only four serviceable fighter aircraft. Um, their army is depleted. Then again, so is ours. You know, our army's been run to the ground because they're looking at a so-called peace dividend. There is no such thing. But these people have never, ever invested since forty-two, uh, since eighty-two. They've never invested in their military because they didn't want to have a junta again. They didn't want to have their politicians thrown out on their ear for being corrupt. And largely, the biggest problem Argentina has is because of corruption in their politicians, like most of South America. So he can get a cabal of nations together in South America to say, yes, at the United Nations, we all need to take the Falklands back. It's a mark of sovereignty for all of us, for all of our islands everywhere. But as we know, the UN is toothless. It does nothing. It will mean nothing. They make lots of noises and have lots of rhetoric. But at the end of the day, the people of the islands are a sovereign nation of their own. They have created their own country. They have their own currency. And they have chosen under whose flag and laws they wish to exist. Mm. And as long as they want that, then we must protect that. If they change their mind at any time, then we must accept that and respect it. But until the, the Argentinian politicians accept that they have no argument, which they don't, there's no legal argument at all for what they, they state, um, they just have to leave it well alone. Um, mm. We... we we can't keep going back and fighting over the same ground. They've continued banging the drum about this for the last 42 years. The islanders have stated their case, um, and they're the only people that are relevant in all of this, not me, not any of the other veterans. You know, we went there because we were paid to do a job. Now, oh. afterwards, we've been intelligent enough to learn about what the politics was about back then. And um, what we know is that we were paid to do a job, not for our opinion. And our job was to do what we did back in 42, in 82. And, and our opinion then was that we were doing what our country and the islanders wanted. Um, and the Argentinians have to accept that. They're the ones who broke international law by invading another country. Mm. They're the ones who, who broke all protocols. Um, but what we've seen is that the world will react as we've seen it happen in Russia and Ukraine. You know, Russia invaded, the world stood with Ukraine, or most of the world. And, and the same must be respected in the case of the Falklands. The, the islanders have got I wonder a fantastic if, Simon, economy. I wonder if in the future, though, it might be seen as the progressive thing, that a future government might decide that actually, oh, the Argentinians, they have, they, they, they deserve this but land back. they've never lived there. Yeah. Not a no, single I know, Argentine but I can just see, I can just islands. foresee, I can just foresee the debate changing. I mean, if we look at the way we discuss these, Simon, we're going to have to leave it there, but it was absolutely fantastic to get your perspective on all of this. Mm. Uh, Simon Weston, who is, of course, a Falklands war veteran, so he knows what he's talking Absolutely. about. And, but uh, can't you see that? Can't you just imagine, um, you know, people on the left potentially I, saying, I, oh, you know, it doesn't really belong to us. I uh, they the, have the only... just as much right to this uh, land as we do, and we should do the right thing and hand, hand them back. And yet the bonkers thing here is that the Brits who live there, the Don't Falkland want... Islanders, have lived there for hundreds yep. of years. Yep. If anything, they're the indigenous people yeah. on those islands that were uninhabited yeah. before Europeans settled there. And actually, frankly, Argentina 
it's not, it's, they're, they're not natives in Argentina. The people that run Argentina, they're of Spanish descent. I can just I mean, see it. I mean, it's colonialists arguing with colonialists. I can just see it, I can just see it. Anyway, let us know what you oh. make of that. GBviews at gbnews.com. We're going to be getting to some of your views on the ECHR and whether you believe Rishi Sunak. Does he have the bottle to actually take us out of the European court? But coming up, are we going soft? On criminals, the UK Sentencing Council is urging judges to consider lighter, softer sentences for offenders who happen to be from poor or deprived backgrounds. Well, this is Good Afternoon Britain on GB News, Britain's election channel. Very good afternoon to you from the newsroom. It's just gone uh, half past 12. And uh, we start with some breaking news coming to us out of Croydon in South London this afternoon, where uh, we understand a woman has been hospitalised after reports that she swallowed a poison. Two police officers have also been exposed to what's been uh, described as that hazardous substance. All three of those people are currently in hospital under observation, specialist police officers and the London Fire Brigade attended that scene in the early hours of this morning where road closures were put in place. Those cordons have now been lifted. Police say, though, that no arrests have so far been made. We will, of course, keep across that for you throughout the rest of this afternoon. To other news, the Prime Minister has been warned the UK could be breaking international law if it continues to sell arms to Israel. 600 legal experts have written to Rishi Sunak, telling him Britain must act because they say there's a plausible risk of genocide in Gaza. Among those who've signed the letter are three former Supreme Court justices, including the court's former president, Lady Hale. The Prime Minister says Britain could pull out of the European Convention on Human Rights if it obstructs the government's Rwanda plan. Rishi Sunak says controlling illegal migration is more important than membership of the ECHR and that he would let, not let what he called the foreign court interfere in sovereign matters. British farmers are calling for a guaranteed basic income after post-Brexit arrangements left many worse off. At least 100 have joined a campaign group urging the government to help cover basic costs after the loss of subsidies from the European Union. It comes as suppliers are warning of higher prices and empty supermarket shelves due to a new post-Brexit border charge, which will be introduced at the end of the month. And air passengers fed up with tight limits on liquids in their carry-on luggage will have to wait even longer for promised changes. Several British airports will miss a June deadline to introduce new high-tech 3D scanners, which were supposed to end the need to remove things like laptops and liquids on flights. It means the 100 millilitre limit on liquids will remain for now, despite promised changes allowing up to two litres. That's the latest from the newsroom for now. Uh, for more, you can sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan the code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. The latest GB News travel. Southbound on the M6, a lane closure and very slow traffic to emergency repairs from Junction 6 for Spaghetti Junction to Castle Bromwich at Junction 5. Anti-clockwise on the M25, there is now a closure whilst accident investigation work continues between Godston at 6 through to Junction 5. Congestion is to Junction 7 at the M23. Diversion routes at Junction 6 past the A25 are also looking very slow. Clockwise, there are queues for three miles at the Clackett Lane services. Southbound on the M57, the exit slip road is closed to Junction 1 to emergency barrier repairs, but an earlier issue on the westbound side of the M4 has cleared. Earlier rolling roadblocks saw delays at Tredega Park at Junction 28. That's now removed. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. I'm Mark Dolan and this is GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Mark Dolan tonight, weekends from 9pm. We've got a problem in this country and it smells like you know what, because it is you know what, it's 
all throughout our waterways. They're absolutely full of it. You'd think in the sixth richest nation you could manage basic sanitation, but in 2024 in the UK, you'd be wrong. And it's so bad that this weekend's boat race was affected by the amount of E. coli in the Thames. I know what you're thinking. When will these kids who go to Oxford and Cambridge universities get a break in life? But it is an embarrassment. We can't hold an event on our rivers now. Uh, the rowers were given safety advice before the race that they should avoid getting any splashed water in their mouths during a rowing race. You might as well tell them to try not to rush. Leonard Jenkins of the Oxford men's team said it would be a lot nicer if there wasn't as much poo in the water. How terrible that that needs to be said. The only time that would be worse is if you read that in a TripAdvisor review of a cafe. On Wednesday, Environment Agency figures revealed raw sewage spills doubled last year in England to 3.6 million hours of spills compared with 1.75 million hours in 2022. I was shocked that it happened so much we have to measure poos by the hour. To put that in context that you might understand, an hour of poo is about 30 trips for a woman and about two for a man. This is because our water systems get overwhelmed when they get a lot of rain. Hello, have you met the UK before? Rain is pretty much our thing. Uh, sewage is spilled into the waterways to prevent them, uh, the system backing up. In a statement issued before the race, Thames Water said, we have experienced higher than average long-term rainfall across London. Yeah, how can you have higher than average long-term rainfall? If it's long-term, it increases the average. Do the math, step up and learn to cope with it. Good afternoon, Britain. It's just coming up to 20 to 1. And you have been getting in touch with our main story of the day. Frankly, does Rishi Sunak have the bottle to leave the ECHR? Yes, it looks like you at home aren't 100% aren't convinced, let's say. David says, we don't have to... Oh, well, Sam says, another joke, it won't happen. Ben says, we won't leave the ECHR. Not one thing Sunak has promised has come to fruition since he became PM. Peter says, Rishi Sunak is weak. He always was and he will always be. He will never ignore even the ECHR. Well, Harry gets in touch to say, what's the point of our Prime Minister saying we're going to come out of foreign courts to stop the boats when one of the main problems we have with illegal immigrants and deportation is the unelected House of Lords? And Harry does make a strong point there in that yeah. it's not just foreign courts that have been getting in the way of Rwanda legislation. Of course, they got in the way of that original flight with their pyjama injunctions. But then it was our own courts, the yeah. High Court, the Supreme Court and the House of Lords that have been frustrating this. Absolutely. Um, lots of obstacles. Uh, Caroline says it's becoming increasingly difficult to believe that Sunak slash the Conservatives would even go through with ignoring the ECHR should they try and stop any Rwanda flights because of the amount of time it's taking for this policy to even come into force. She's becoming more and more sceptical of whether the Conservatives truly believe in sorting out the illegal migrant issue. Well, it's interesting you say that because that was Robert Jenrick's claim, wasn't it? The former immigration minister. He claimed that Rishi Sunak wasn't really bothered about the issue of immigration. So uh, if you believe what Robert Jenrick said, you might take that view that this just isn't really a genuine priority of the Prime Minister's. And yet David has a contrary view. He Go says on. we don't have to leave the court. We can just ignore it on this matter, as others have done. For example, France. We're a sovereign country. And it is true, there are countries that have done and do ignore certain rulings of the ECHR, ignore certain orders of the ECHR. Indeed, the United Kingdom did so in the coalition era when we said no to prisoner voting. Keep your views coming in on that one. Maybe someone will write in saying uh, we believe Rishi Sunak, he's trying his best in a mm. difficult situation. That's the other side. Well, um, should we move on to something that has really become a, 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 a quite a curious story here? The UK Sentencing Council, a really significant body, has emphasised the need for judges to consider softer sentences by offenders who come from deprived or challenging backgrounds. Hmm. Well, Justice Secretary Alex Chalk has criticised this, with many calling the new guidelines extremely patronising. Well, it comes as growing concerns on prison overcrowding, uh, prompting this re-evaluation of sentencing practices. But the question remains, are we too soft? on criminals and frankly should we be making these decisions based on overcrowding 
Yes, well, that is a key point, isn't it? Is that what this is all about, mm. rather than ideology? Uh, joining us now to discuss this is retired Scotland Yard Detective Inspector Hamish Brown, MBE. Hamish, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Lots of people will look at this and worry that judges may be uh, encouraged to make excuses for offenders. Oh, it wasn't his fault that he was a violent sex offender. It's because he came from a challenging background. Well, in my uh, very varied retirement from the Metropolitan Police, I've done all sorts of agency work and I had the privilege for some time working with the National Probation Service, not as a probation officer, but doing investigation, covering the courts, that sort of thing. And having sat in many magistrates' courts and indeed Crown Courts, and I've listened to the sentencing and the process to it, it's quite right that the judges should know something about an offender's background to weigh up the, the type of sentence. And invariably, the National Probation Service, qualified probation officers, they're called upon to do what's known as a PSR, a pre-sentence report. And these things are really thorough. It goes on for pages. And it gives a background of the defendant and will assist the court and does assist the court in what sentence should be meted out. So the social background certainly comes into it. But on the other side of the coin, people who commit particularly the most serious of crimes, uh, they've got to face the full penalty of the law. And I'm talking about violence, particularly armed robberies. I'm talking about sexual offences, particularly rapes and that sort of thing. Um, you can't just go and reduce the sentence because of someone's um, economic or, or other background. That, that's quite ridiculous. But taking a defendant as a whole, maybe uh, th there are children, there are handicapped children in the family, and that will weigh um, on the judge's mind, and I've seen it, saying if I lock you up, who's going to look after your children sort of thing. So there are all sorts of things that come into play. So I think um, it does exist already, but I don't think it should be a statutory um, example that something that has to be followed because someone comes from a deprived background. The whole situation mm. of someone's background should be taken into account and the correct sentence given. Do you think there's an issue here with the fact that the Sentencing Council seemingly is brushing up against uh, the politician who is the Justice Secretary. There's an elected politician who's saying one thing and an unelected sentencing council saying another. Surely these two groups should be working together, but it seems that they're rubbing heads. <sighs> Well, I suppose in any civilised society, you're going to take opinion from all, all sorts of bodies. Um, but we're a democracy. We can hear what other people have to say. And uh, at the end of the day, the government of the day is answerable through the ballot box. But I think there's something a little bit more here. And you alluded to it in your introduction. Um, in, in as much the prison overcrowding, mm. is this just another plank to get into that? And I, I suspect it's it may well be the prisons are absolutely heaving. At what stage are you going to say, stop, do short sentences work? And someone who sent people to prison, many people for long, long sentences, uh, but why am I talking this way? Well, if someone goes to prison for a few months, that will be halved anyway. They mm. might get a little bit knocked off to come out on electronic tag, and they probably met a drug dealer or something like that inside. So it's the right measure but I have every suspicion this is another plan because it's another aspect to uh, try and deal with the uh, prison overcrowding. Well, thank you very much indeed. Really great to speak to you. Hamish Brown, MBE, retired Scotland Yard detective inspector. I don't know where it ends, though, with because uh, it, is, it is making excuses. I mean, if someone mm. shoplifts, for example, should they get a lesser sentence if they happen to be deprived? Can you really go down that road? Is it patronising? Lots of people from very deprived backgrounds would never even consider committing a crime. I thought we were all equal under the law. Mm. I thought that was the principle on Not which really. this country was, was meant to run. Uh, but, but clearly, some people are more equal than others. Yes. Um, well, we're going to be having this debate later in the show, so stay tuned for that. Two very different views on all this, so uh, stay with us.
Hello and welcome to the latest forecast for GB News from the Met Office. A lot of cloud today and there will be showers for many of us as well, particularly in the south, further north. It's good to stay cold with this east to northeasterly wind as low pressure moves away. A weak weather front bringing a legacy of cloudy skies for much of the country. Some decent bright spells for the northwest of Scotland and the southeast of England, but in between a few showers, especially for the north of Scotland, where those showers will be falling as snow over the hills. And across central and southern England, Wales, where the showers will be heavy at times, particularly early afternoon. Feeling quite warm away from the showers in the south, 16 or 17 Celsius, a stark contrast further north. Northern England, Scotland, Northern Ireland feeling cold. And with that cold air in place, we're going to see a band of rain move north overnight. And that's going to be falling as snow over the hills of northern England and then eventually across southern and central Scotland. Some significant snow by dawn. Also some significant rain at lower levels, particularly through the central belt, could cause some issues. A wet start for many places, mild in the south, windy with that as well, with these bands of rain moving through. But that significant snow there across central and increasingly northern Scotland could cause some issues with uh, 20 centimetres or so building up over higher routes. Now, as we go into the afternoon, uh, brighter spells and blustery showers form in the south, further spells of rain for Northern Ireland, Scotland and Northern England, where it will stay on the cold side. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. It's going up to 10 to 1. And Britain's automotive industry is going from strength to strength, with new car registrations up by more than 10% in March. That's recording its 20th consecutive month of growth. Really good manufacturing figures. And that's according to new figures from the Society of Motor Manufacturer and Traders. See some of you write in asking, where's, all, where's the good news? Why do yes. you never deliver good news? Well, here's some good news. But... It's not great news for electric vehicles or EVs because uh, sales plummeted last month with the average buyer saying they're put off by high prices, recharge times and poor charging infrastructure. So uh, a tale of two there. Yes, tale of two halves. Tale of two halves. But joining us now is the motor trade expert Fraser Brown. Um, Fraser, it's interesting looking at these sales figures. Uh, there was a big, big perhaps hype loop um, last year and the year before on, on EVs, on electric vehicles. Um, but perhaps we've reached a, a plateau and everyone that wanted one has maybe saturated that market more than was expected. It is very interesting. Um, obviously, we've seen a 10% uh, rise in the market, so the number of vehicles registered uh, this month. Um, very interestingly, March is one of the plate change months and it's one of our biggest registration months in the calendar year. So the figures that come out in March are particularly useful and gives a very good indication as to what's really going on. Now, there are two things that hide beneath the headlines from these figures. The first thing is that we're seeing very weak retail demand. So the private buyer um, in the market isn't coming out. They're, they're really hard to find mm. and manufacturers are having to spend a lot of money 
um, to kind of register to get cars registered. They're putting an awful lot of discounts on the table at the moment, um, and we're finally seeing a, a push of vehicles into the market rather than a pull from re from customers. Uh, we've had issues with semiconductors and various other things, so they've not been supplying cars from manufacturers as fast since the pandemic. We now seem to be over that. Manufacturers are pushing cars into the market again, um, and and yeah, there's a, there's another underlying story around EVs as well. Yes, Fraser, with the electric vehicles, they've had a bit of bad press, haven't they, recently, over the last year or so? People talking about how electric vehicles could uh, blow up or go up in flames. I mean, we've seen buses go up in flames, haven't we? No more than and we've seen, car. we've seen quite um, prominent commentators, journalists coming out to say they regret buying their electric vehicle for various reasons. Is that fair? And uh, do you think that's impacting these sales? Well, I have absolutely no doubt the negative press around EVs. A lot of it is completely untrue. Um, statistics on vehicle fires show that an EV is 10 times less likely to set fire than an internal combustion engine. That's industry-wide and insurance company-based figures. Um, and the other thing to remember, I've lived with an electric vehicle for seven years now, OK? Um, and I have only used public charging... Oh, a very few times in an average year, I might use it a handful of times because the best time to charge an electric car is overnight. And every morning your car's full. So if you buy a car that does 300 miles, which is fairly standard for an electric car these days, you never go near public charging. So public charging infrastructure, while it's not completely irrelevant, is not a major issue. And 60% of drivers have access to domestic overnight charging. We can fill a car that will do 300 miles up with about seven pounds worth of electricity you go out and buy a petrol mm. car and it might cost you depending on how efficient it is and how large the car is that might cost you 80 or 100 pounds to fill that vehicle up so whilst electric cars as new cars are slightly more expensive than their uh, internal combustion engine counterparts um an electric car to run is massively cheaper your average person will it be for that long though miles... fraser will it be for that long they'll find other ways of taxing you <laughs> won't they they'll find other ways when they run out of the petrol and diesel money Potentially, but the, the key issue is that electricity overnight is really cheap mm. because we, we, we can't use it. You know, they have streetlights over on the M62 motorway on overnight to use up the electricity that has to be generated because you can't turn mm. power stations off overnight. They have to produce a base load. So yeah. why not use that electricity in cars rather than wasting it in other ways? It's a very, so very good point. And if anyone with a smart meter can see just how much cheaper electricity yeah. is at three in the morning compared to six in the, after in, in the afternoon. But uh, Fraser Brown, thank you so much for coming on and talking us through that. I think the, o the only thing there is, what if you don't have a drive? What if you can't charge your car well, on yeah. the streets? Coming up, council's not building time, the, to the 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 <laughs> time to leave the ECHR. Time to leave the ECHR. Rishi Sunak has said that he uh, would be up for it, potentially. A brighter outlook with Box Solar and sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello and welcome to the latest forecast for GB News from the Met Office. A lot of cloud today and there will be showers for many of us as well, particularly in the south, further north. It's good to stay cold with this east to northeasterly wind as low pressure moves away. A weak weather front bringing a legacy of cloudy skies for much of the country. Some decent bright spells for the northwest of Scotland and the southeast of England, but in between a few showers, especially for the north of Scotland, where those showers will be falling as snow over the hills. And across central and southern England, Wales, where the showers will be heavy at times, particularly early afternoon. Feeling quite warm away from the showers in the south, 16 or 17 Celsius, a stark contrast further north. Northern England, Scotland, Northern Ireland feeling cold. And with that cold air in place, we're going to see a band of rain move north overnight. And that's going to be falling as snow over the hills of northern England and then eventually across southern and central Scotland. Some significant snow by dawn. Also some significant rain at lower levels, particularly through the central belt, could cause some issues. A wet start for many places, mild in the south, windy with that as well, with these bands of rain moving through. But that significant snow there across central and increasingly northern Scotland could cause some issues with uh, 20 centimetres or so building up over higher routes. Now, as we go into the afternoon, uh, brighter spells and blustery showers form in the south, further spells of rain for Northern Ireland, Scotland and Northern England, where it will stay on the cold side. 
warm feeling inside. From Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. Fretch chance to win a prize worth over £20,000. Text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Farage, Monday to Thursday from 7 p.m. I believe our farmers can compete globally. If I visit some Somerset farmers, they are extremely efficient and highly competitive and innovative, and we do it to encourage the best. And it's a high-end product. It's a high-end product, which was one of the points and, that was being made earlier. And that we have to focus on what we are good at, and what our, our protectionism does at the moment is protects Irish beef farmers, French beef farmers, and Dutch beef farmers, as opposed to buying cheaper beef from Australia. I have no desire Jacob, the to problem, protect the EU farms. The problem is that we live in the Northern Hemisphere and we have a very difficult climate. So actually, and we know this because when the Corn Laws were repealed in 1846, we know yeah. darned well what happened to agriculture. It led to cheap <laughs> bread. It made the society much better. But this, this, is this, 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 this has been an argument. This has been an argument going but on for 150 it's years. Simply, yes. It's simply wrong. British agriculture didn't collapse at that point. There was a glut in the market 30 years later, which the, comes much Well, obviously, after the things corner. were much slower in those days. It took no, a long no. time for that I, to no, I, Actually, do you know what? The principles of that debate and this debate are not dissimilar. No, that's They're right. not they dissimilar. It's very, very... They're I always dissimilar. go on about the, 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 my favourite that, topic. No, 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 no. And it was, uh, a, it was a wonderful upwelling and grassroots campaign and all the rest of it. But whether we have a Conservative or a Labour government... Do you feel, I mean, do you actually think that a Labour government will be any closer or more connected to your community than this Look, Conservative one? The Labour government is in their interest to make sure that Britain has got food. And with the way the world is right now, um, mm. we're in a very fragile situation, well, which is why we need food security. And every farmer I know <coughs> talks about food well, we security because, because we at, understand um, how much less food look, is being We better have a look at net zero commitments yeah, too, but another right, time. Right. Net zero, net zero, zero commitments are... Um, I know, that's, it'll be, that's yeah, your yeah, government. It'll be wind right. farms, it'll enough, be so enough, powerful. enough. We can, argue, we can argue all night about we this. Can, Let's yes. do it. I'm up for arguing all night. Good afternoon, Britain. It's one o'clock on Thursday, the 4th of April. The nuclear option. Rishi Sunak has said he's prepared to withdraw from the European Convention of Human Rights and its court if that's what it takes to stop the boats. Last night, he said controlling immigration is more important than any foreign court. Two-tier justice. British judges have been told to consider softening sentences for criminals if they happen to come from deprived or difficult backgrounds. So, should poorer people spend less time behind bars? We'll be debating that question very shortly. And Falkland's threat. The new maverick president of Argentina has announced his roadmap to seize control of the British overseas territory of the Falklands. Should we be worried? What do you reckon? Is this patronising guff that uh, poorer people or those from deprived backgrounds should get softer sentences? Or is that just something that the justice system should do? Take into account someone's background, take into account the difficulties they may have suffered as a child or, you know, in their young adult adulthood? If you kill someone, mm. I don't care if you're rich or poor, mm. you've killed someone. Mm. You should get the same sentence. If you break and enter, I don't care if you're rich and or poor. You've broken and entered. If you commit grievous bodily harm to someone, 
Doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. You've committed grievous bodily harm. So it's a bit of an insult to people who have who come from deprived and challenging backgrounds who haven't resorted to crime. Is it not? The bigotry of low expectations. It is a bit, isn't it? Bigotry of low expectations, good way of putting it. I wonder what you at home think. Do you think there's ever a case to give someone a more lenient sentence because they've had a difficult life or they've come from a very poor background? Perhaps if they were caught shoplifting or burglary or something like that, should you say, well, they haven't got any money? So patronising yeah. because there are people who come from very deprived backgrounds who would never, ever, ever even imagine for one second stealing from a shop. And I think the evidence is quite clear. When we've interviewed people who run small shops, corner shops, who are in charge of security in shops, they say time and time again, the people stealing things, they're not stealing them for themselves. They're not stealing them because they can eat them, right? It's, it's, not, the, it's not sort of cheap bits of food that get nicked off the shelves. It's the expensive items that do. It's people that want to sell them on. Also, there's lots of rich people who commit crimes too. Yes. Let us know what you make of this. We're going to be debating this uh, question very shortly, but let's get your headlines. Tom and Emily, thank you very much. Good afternoon from the newsroom. It's just after one o'clock. The headlines this lunchtime. The Prime Minister says Britain could pull out of the European Convention on Human Rights if it obstructs the government's Rwanda plan. Rishi Sunak says controlling illegal migration is more important than membership of the ECHR and that he would not let what he called the foreign interference of courts in sovereign matters. Labour accused the Prime Minister of trying to appease the hard right of his party. More than 600 British legal experts, including three former Supreme Court judges, are calling on the UK to stop selling arms to Israel. They say there is a plausible risk that the weapons may be used to commit serious violations of international law and that the Prime Minister must change Britain's policy. Shadow Business Secretary Jonathan Reynolds says the government should publish the legal advice it's received on the UK's arrangements with Israel. The law of the UK is very, very clear. If there is any possibility of anything exported from the UK being involved in a serious violation of, of humanitarian law, it cannot be exported from the UK. So the government will have had legal advice on that specific to the conflict in Gaza. We've asked them to publish that legal advice. It would be, I think, a reasonable step, given what, what has happened in the last few days and what has happened over the last few months, to make clear the legal position and to make sure the government itself and we are currently complying with UK law. Meanwhile, the United Nations has put its missions in Gaza on hold while charities there review their humanitarian work in the region. It's after seven aid workers were killed by an Israeli airstrike on Monday. They were part of a group from the World Central Kitchen organisation whose vehicles were hit while travelling on an approved humanitarian route. Among those who died were three British nationals, John Chapman, James Henderson and James Kirby. The charity's founder has accused Israeli forces of targeting its workers systematically, car by car. Foreign editor of Jewish News, Yotam Confino, told GB News earlier that a full investigation must now take place. Whether this was systematic and, and deliberate, actually going after these aid workers, I think that remains to be seen until the Israel can really um, present some of its investigation fully to the world. But it makes no sense for Israel to target this organization because not only is it working closely with this organization, it's actually helping them distribute the food that they deliver from Cyprus. Back here in the UK, farmers are calling for a guaranteed basic income after post-Brexit arrangements left many worse off. At least 100 have joined a campaign group urging the government to help cover basic costs after the loss of subsidies from the European Union. Analysis last year by the organic farming group Riverford found that half of Britain's fruit and vegetable growers may go out of business within a year. It comes as suppliers are warning of higher prices and empty supermarket shelves due to new post-Brexit border charges that will be introduced at the end of the month. There were record levels of crime at co-op supermarkets last year, with reportedly more than 100 shop workers facing abuse from criminals in those shops every day. Its annual report said that supermarket chain co-op says the level of retail crime incidents has soared by 44% in the space of just one year. It recorded more than 330,000 cases of shoplifting and antisocial behaviour at its food stores in 2023, which is the equivalent of 1,000 cases every day. 
Judges have been told to consider more lenient sentences for offenders from deprived or from difficult backgrounds. The Sentencing Council, which sets guidelines for judges and magistrates, has for the first time outlined mitigating factors that it says courts should consider before handing down a sentence. Those factors include poverty, low education, discrimination and insecure housing. But critics say the law should treat everyone equally, with Justice Secretary Alex Chalk describing those guidelines as patronising and inaccurate. Weather news and strong winds and heavy rain are set to hit parts of Britain this weekend as Storm Kathleen rolls in. That's the 11th named storm in just eight months. Gusts of up to 70 miles an hour are expected on Saturday along the west coast of England, with 50 miles an hour winds expected in other areas. The Met Office is urging people to take care, with coastal areas also expecting to see large waves. And finally, the world's oldest man has died just two months before, would you believe it, he could have celebrated his 115th birthday. Juan Vicente Perez was born in Venezuela in 1909, nearly 20 years before even the first radio station started broadcasting there. There were six British monarchs during his long lifetime and 20 US presidents. His death was announced by the governor of the region where he lived, who described him as a humble, hard-working and peaceful man. That's the latest from the newsroom for now. Plenty more to come with Tom and Emily. Until then, you can, of course, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. It's 1.08 in the afternoon and controlling illegal migration is more important than our membership of any foreign court. Who said that? Well, those are the words of Rishi Sunak, our Prime Minister, who gave maybe his strongest hint yet that he's willing to rip up the UK's international obligations to stop the boats and get the Rwanda flights off the ground. Well, he was speaking to The Sun last night, The Sun newspaper, and the Prime Minister said illegal immigration offended his sense of fairness, adding that the Rwanda scheme was fundamental to our sovereignty. Although he sidestepped a question on whether he would pledge to leave the ECHR in the election manifesto. So there's the fundamental difference. <sighs> He's saying that he believes the Rwanda can work, but if the ECHR were to stop it, he might leave it. It's very irritating, isn't it? Well, it's almost when like they hint stage... at things, you flirt with the idea, you try and sort of convince the public that you're tough and you're getting tough and you'll do but, whatever it takes. But, maybe but then actually right. in reality, you know, all these conservative politicians, all of these conservative prime ministers have hinted at the same, yet mm. nothing seems to ever change. But maybe he's right. Maybe the safety of Rwanda bill, if it ever becomes an act of parliament, if the House of Lords ever stop their opposition to it, uh, maybe it would be enough. Maybe he doesn't need to leave the ECH. Not convinced. Not convinced because people will still have the right to appeal. I know it's, it should be restricted in this bill, but in practice, the lawyers are very clever indeed. Shall we head to Westminster and speak to our political editor, Christopher Hope? Uh, so Rishi Sunak coming out stronger, apparently, than he has previously, um, suggesting that we could perhaps ignore, leave the ECHR. What do you make of it? Yeah, well, hi, both. That's right. He's, he's moving towards a position, maybe, of oh, maybe reviewing membership of the ECHR at the election. That's maybe where it's going. He's not there yet. Look at the language, though, from Rishi Sunak last night to the tabloid newspaper's viewers, uh, the Sun, uh, Sun TV. I do believe that border security and making sure that we can control illegal migration is more important than membership of a foreign court because it, it's found fundamental to our sovereignty as a country. Now, he's a Brexiteer. Back in 2016, he, he campaigned, sort of, to leave the European Union. He certainly has voted to leave the European Union and has made much of that since then. For, for many, I think, the idea of that a, a court in Strasbourg can restrict what our own parliament orders to happen uh, using UK law does go against the, the idea of that vote back in 2016. For some Brexiteers, leaving the ECHR, the Strasbourg court, the foreign court described by the PM, is a bit of uh, tidying up uh, loose ends from the Brexit process. Those on the left of the Tory party would definitely disagree with that, with that. And in fact, many or some might resign from the cabinet were this to happen. And that's why he's showing a bit of leg to Sun voters. <laughs> and I went to number 10 today for GB News to understand what he meant by that. They've said that he's saying that if it came to it, if it came to it, 
and the ECHR was the block on the Rwanda flights taking off after the after the middle of April, we would consider leaving. So there's a couple of conditional tenses in there to uh, annoy you a bit, Emily. <laughs> it is a bit annoying, yes, uh, because the ECHR has blocked deportations. Uh, so why was it not a big enough deal then? Well, that, that, that's, that's the point. Um, it's been seized on by Tory MPs on the right of the party. Uh, Jonathan Gullis is the party's new uh, deputy chairman. He tweeted, retweeted the remarks last night and said Britain will leave the ECHR if that's what it takes to stop the small boats. Sunak tells some readers he's adopting the language there that we will leave if we have to, which is going a bit further, I think, than the PM was in his interview with The Sun. He's, he's walking a quite a narrow line here. I think if the, if the Tory party does fight on, on a, a, a bid to leave the ECHR, that for some on the left of the party will be too much and you will see, will see resignations from the government. So he's trying to hold it all together and talk to a kind of blue-collar audience, as, as he would see at The Sun, who wants this to happen. It's interesting looking at the debates around the ECHR because sometimes politicians have been very upset when members of the government call this a foreign court. Rishi Sunak's words, of course, were that uh, this is a foreign court and border security matters more. Uh, Chris, I want to show you a written question put forward by a, an SNP politician, Patrick Grady, uh, who asked, why on earth is the Prime Minister calling this a foreign court? Well, uh, Rishi Sunak had a very simple answer to that written question in Parliament only last month. He said, because it's based in Strasbourg. <laughs> Yeah, yes. I mean, he, he first used the term foreign court about, about the turn of the year. An interview with me for GB News, he called it a foreign court. Um, I think, yeah, as you say there, the PM is saying literally it's based in Strasbourg. Defenders, though, of the current uh, status quo would say because the UK has signed up to that court, and we have representatives among the, uh, the several dozen uh, just, just judges who are in charge of the rulings there, we are signed up to it, so we are part of it. It's kind of a, a supranational body that we have a stake in. But of course he's right, literally it's not in the UK, it's not in the former uh, Middlesex County Court where the Supreme Court is now based, it's not here, it's over there, therefore it's foreign. Because the idea of foreign uh, for some people uh, does sort of indicate a kind of otherness which they don't like about it. But he's right, the PM is correct, it's, it's foreign, it's not here. <laughs> yes, I'm sure some people would argue it's some kind of dog whistle uh, to call it a foreign court, but of course yeah. it is. Uh, Christopher Hope, thank you very much, our political editor, live from Westminster. Well, shall we get the thoughts now of former Labour MP Stephen Pound? Uh, Stephen, <laughs> do you believe that the United Kingdom could uh, ultimately withdraw from the ECHR if they were to fundamentally blow up this Rwanda legislation? Look, it would be absolute, total, utter, complete irrelevance on stilts if they left the ECHR. The, the courts that are actually blocking around that are our own domestic courts and our own House of Lords. And don't forget, we have um, His Honour Judge Tim Icke, who is the British representative at Strasbourg. We're not doing any of this. Look, the reality of this is we all know in our heart of hearts that Rwanda isn't going to work, it cannot work, and it's not the fault of Strasbourg. I always, in times of trouble, turn to Kenny Rogers. And you know in Kenny Rogers, the gambler, he's got those great lines, you've got to know when to hold them, you've got to know when to fold them. I have to say to Rishi, A, he gives the impression that he couldn't knock the skin off a rice pudding, so he doesn't give the impression that he's tough on this issue. And secondly, by putting all his money on those cards marked Rwanda, he's actually riding for a fall because it ain't going to happen. They ain't going to get the pains to take them off. If they mm. do, it's going to be blocked by anyone. It's not going to be blocked by Judge Ike and his colleagues in Strasbourg. It's going to be blocked by our House of Lords, our Stephen, Supreme Court. Stephen, our you judicial. say... Stephen, you say the ECHR is an irrelevance here, but did it not uh, no, no, no. help ground sorry. that uh, first yeah. Rwanda-bound flight? Yeah. Sorry, sorry, uh, Emily, I, I didn't say the ECHR is an irrelevance. The ECHR is very important. I'm, I'm with Winston Churchill on the importance of, of having this sort of standard of decency in Europe. What I'm saying is that if you took the ECHR out of the equation, do you don't honestly think that would Im immediately create a great fleet of Dakotas and Chinooks you know, whizzing off this, to southern Africa? It ain't going to happen. It's not the ECHR that is blocking Rwanda flights. It's British domestic legislators. Yes, of course, you're, you're right as things stand, but that's precisely why the Rwanda bill is currently going through Parliament. The Rwanda yeah. bill will, will sit above 
any ruling from our own Supreme Court. This country isn't like America. This country isn't like a, a country with a codified constitution where there's an equal balance of powers between the legislature and the judiciary. In this country, Parliament is sovereign and it sits above the judiciary. So if Parliament says this is what the law is, the Supreme Court has to follow that. Uh, not necessarily, because the House of Lords comes into play. The, the House of Lords is part of the judiciary, you know, a, a part of the legislature. You're mm. absolutely right. We don't have a Bill of Rights in this country. I think maybe we should have a Bill of Rights. I don't know. But we don't at the present time. And Parliament, in the name of the monarch, let's not forget, is supreme, just as the monarch is, is supreme over Parliament. So, however, the House of Lords is an amending a, a body, and they can do this. I mean, you and I know, come in, in all honesty, so I, I admire your... I, I wouldn't say it's naivety, because you're far too shrewd to be called naive, but if you believe you're going to work, you know, I'd like I've got a but, but Stephen, Stephen, on this point, do you not think, therefore, that the House of Lords will block this bill? Because uh, every political commentator, every an, um, yeah. analyst, indeed the Labour front bench in the House of Lords are saying, actually, eventually, we'll let the Rwanda bill go through, probably when Parliament returns in just a couple of weeks' yeah. time. If that yeah, Rwanda bill becomes an act of Parliament passed by both the Commons and the Lords, yeah. it sits above the Supreme Court. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, at the moment, not everybody on the front bench is saying it. Certainly the Liberal Democrats on the front bench aren't saying And the bishops, don't forget, we're in this bizarre situation in the UK. That I think the only other country is Iran, where theological and religious leaders sit in the legislature by right of theology. Um, and don't forget that the, the bishops and, and the Archbishop of Canterbury would be very strong about this. So it's not automatic. But even if it did happen, even if, in the best of all possible worlds, you have this situation where the House of Lords give in, roll over, the law becomes law, it gets signed off by the king, where are they going to get the planes from? Where are they going to get the people to actually fly everybody to? And are we really prepared to spend, what's it, 100, 120,000 pounds mm. per person when we should be spending that money on making the Home Office work, getting the scrotes out of well, here if they've okay, got no right Okay, to Stephen, I take your point. As it stands, it's been very costly, this plan, yeah. and it has not borne fruit. So, what is your solution to this problem? Because yeah. at the moment, the Labour Party is just saying, oh, we'll smash the gangs, but the government is yeah. trying to do that. Very thick. Well, the, the, the Labour Party is saying much more than that. Don't forget, when we're in power, what we did was we accepted the fact, the reality, that some people who are seeking asylum in this country have every right to that asylum. I'm thinking particularly of people who worked as interpreters for us in Afghanistan and people who are coming, say, from Iran. If we sent them back, you would be scimitars are being sharpened on the tarmac the minute the plane landed. So there's some people, I'd rather get them into this country legally and paying tax. To do that, we have to differentiate between those people, and you even all come up with the names of the types of the person we're talking about, you know, the young guys in their 20s who really should not be here. We've got to make the sclerotic, incompetent Home Office work so that the people who have a right to be here, we can get them out of the hotels and we can get them contributing and paying tax. And the rest of them, let's put them in the back of my car and I'll drive them back to Tirana tomorrow. <laughs> well, I think they can is... appeal to the courts, though, can't they? They can appeal to their yeah. courts. It's against their human rights to go back to whatever country they came from, uh, Stephen. Gosh, uh, we, thank you. Don't forget, what we did last time was we did these. We, it, we uh, did the sorting in France. We actually mm. had interview officers in France, and that's when it worked, because the people didn't mm. even get across the judge. Look at the figures for the last year of the Labour government. It, it's a tiny proportion of those hundreds of thousands of people who are flooding across. Now, you could say, so no doubt, the Conservatives would say this country is a much better, bigger, big lure. It's more magnetic under the Conservatives. Mm. Well, I'd rather we weren't that magnetic, to be perfectly honest. But you'd rather a smaller economy? <laughs> uh, no, uh, no, I'd rather a slightly smaller population. Well, there Goodness you go. Me. There you go, on wow. that bombshell. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed, Stephen Pound. Always great to speak to you. Mm. Former Labour MP putting up a good fight, I say. No, I think the problem with... Because, obviously, ideally, we'd have offshore processing. Yeah. And we'd say, you know, if you, if you think you want to claim asylum in the UK, come to this centre, we've got it in France, turn up there, say your case and we'll let you in or you won't. The problem is... The obligations we signed up to in the 1950s, the UN uh, agreement that governs all of this, well, technically, under the terms of that, hundreds of millions, potentially billions of people have yeah. the theoretical right. Anyone who says they're oppressed by their government, that's all of China. Also, that's Stephen all of says, Afghanistan. Stephen says, oh, the Labour Party could just deport, you know, asylum seekers who aren't actually legitimate asylum seekers. But uh, what do we see when that happens? Mm. Do you think the Conservative government doesn't want to uh, deport people who don't have a legitimate right to be here? They can go to the courts.
Well, much more to come, of course. Speaking of the courts, we'll be talking about the UK Sentencing Council. It's been urging judges to go soft on criminals from deprived backgrounds. Well, is this right? That is the debate, the fiery debate we'll be having after this. Britain's Newsroom. Weekday mornings from 9.30. It's a remarkable story, isn't it? Amazing. Extraordinary. And also, she was unflappable, apparently, yeah. the Princess Royal. She just brilliant. refused to get out of the car and said, I'm not going anywhere. Extraordinary. Well, Jim Beaton was awarded the George Cross for protecting the princess and delighted to say, joins us now, along with the former head of Royal Royalty Protection, Di Davis. Jim, you won't remember, but I met you some time ago at the Imperial War Museum when Princess Anne was opening an exhibition to do with the George Cross and you were there reunited with her. Um, and you told me then what great admiration you had for the princess, cool under fire, but you didn't do so badly yourself. It was probably my job. And also, um, I had a wee bit of police training, not very much, but a little bit. Uh, whereas uh, Princess Anne had nothing, and yet the way she displayed it, you would have thought she'd been uh, highly trained to um, deal with any type of that situation. Even though you'd had some training, you took three bullets for the princess. You effectively stood between her and a deranged gunman. Well, I was supposed to be a protection officer, really, so um, I just tried to fuddle about. You must remember that back in 1974, there was no communication, and we were extremely lucky that Michael Hills, who was outside Clarence House and nearby, had got one of the fast police radios, um, or radios on his shoulder, so he was able to send a message out. Otherwise, we would have just been relying in the good old public to phone in and say there was something happening. Yeah, so been... times have changed drastically. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. It's 124. You're watching and listening to Good Afternoon Britain. Now, judges have been told to consider more lenient sentences for those people, those criminals, who come from difficult or deprived backgrounds. Now, lots of you have been getting in touch on this and we're about to debate it, but I just want to go to some of our views. Davy says, poverty in a hard life is not an excuse for becoming a criminal. As the youngest of five children, my father died of cancer when I was two. All five of us were brought up by our mum and we married, bought our own homes, all by working. None of us were in trouble with the law. Well, Jude says, no, let's encourage them, make life easier for them, and all the sooner they'll be completely running the country. And if you don't want that, clamp down on the unruly, disruptive, uncaring families that go on to have children of a similar ilk that are able to challenge police teachers' shopkeepers. Um, is she being I, sarcastic there? I don't know if she's being sarcastic or not, but, but I suppose you could say that that's a countering view, saying if you just encourage these families, they won't be as likely to be criminal. But, um, but then again... Perhaps she is being sarcastic. And Mike asks a very interesting question. Will criminals from privileged backgrounds receive tougher sentences? Yes, if you were 
had a very had very rich parents, lived in a lovely area, went to private school, went off to Oxbridge, and then became a violent criminal. Should you get a tougher sentence because you've had everything on a silver plate? Yes, or a no, silver that, spoon. That is an interesting question, and I suppose it'll be much. Uh, I, I, I don't suppose that the sentencing council, who are the people behind this proposal, will be saying that. And the reason I don't think they will be is this is all in one direction. This is all about promoting ways in which fewer people can go to prison. Why? Well, we're running out of prison spaces. Right, well, let's have this debate. Uh, we're joined now by the author of Among the Hoods, My Years with a Teenage Gang, Harriet Sargent, thank you, who disagrees Hello. with the guidance, and by the Chair of Communities Against Violence, Ken Hines, who thinks there is a place for this. OK, Harriet, let's start with you. Why do you think it's a nonsense for uh, there to be given lenient sentences if you come from a poorer background? Well, I mean, it's kind of the sentencing guide at council have gone in for a means tested sentencing. And what is this saying to the huge numbers of people from very poor and disadvantaged backgrounds who have managed not to uh, commit a criminal offence? Mm -hmm. That's that what is you know, it's very deeply patronizing towards them. And also, it seems to entirely overlook, which let's face it, the criminal justice system does quite often the views of the victims in all of this. Now, if you come from a disadvantaged background, you're twice as likely to be victim of uh, rape or violence or robbery than if you come from a middle-class background. And how are you going to feel if you are a victim and your next-door neighbour, who's, uh, I don't know, robbed you or whatever, is suddenly given a, a more lenient sentence because of his background? I mean, this is completely mad. Well, let's throw that right to Ken Hines. Have the Sentencing Council got their priorities wrong here? No, they've got it right, because, first of all, we're not talking about uh, Crown Court guidelines. We're talking about magistrates. And what the magistrates' courts can do, they can give you up to six months' imprisonment, and that's for a low-level crime. And the crimes that I'm thinking about that should be differentiated is people doing shoplifting as a last resort. Mothers who cannot afford to get nappies may go in and try to steal a pack of nappies. You've got other people who are homeless that might want to go and steal a sandwich. We should not be sending them to prison. We were overrepresented in prison with people that should not be there and should be dealt with by community other um, sanctions. So I totally agree with this sanctioning body because what I find with the magistrate, they do not have the same kind of lived experience or experience that a Crown Court judge would have. And they're, they're quick to send, send people to prison for, for nonsense, for little minor things. We need to stop that. Harriet? Yeah, well, this is actually the, the Sentencing Council sought advice from magistrates and judges. So the, this is not just about magistrates, it's judges as well. And then they t entirely disregarded uh, what the magistrates and judges said. And the magistrates and judges said, well, you know, actually, we're already doing this. We're already taking into account uh, people's backgrounds. We don't need to be told to do this. And it just seems to be a kind of, you know, a, a, a nanny state um, sentencing that is telling everybody what should be done and not leaving it up to the judges and the magistrates. I have to agree. I mean, I, I've, I've spent quite a lot of time in court with people and, and uh, the judges seem to me to know what they're doing and come to very fair decisions and take into account all kinds of people's backgrounds. And I think mm. that's been done already. We don't need to prescribe what should be done. Well, let's throw that back to Ken. These judges know what they're doing. Generally, the judges do know what they're doing. I'm talking about the Crown Court. Um, I've got very little faith in the, in the um, judges on the magistrates' um, circuits. I feel, at the end of the day, they're too quick to send people to prison for minor indiscretion, even things like council tax or, 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 mm -hmm. minor, or, or road, mm -hmm. road offences, um, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, um, um, for driving while disqualified, mm -hmm. things of that nature. 
That is not what. That's a different issue, be though, it's isn't it? That's a different enough. issue, though, isn't it? Because this is about whether you should get a more lenient sentence because you happen to have come from a very challenging or poor, deprived background. Now, there are lots of people who come from challenging backgrounds and haven't had anything given to them on a plate and have suffered in their childhood who don't go on to commit crimes. So, isn't this double standards? Uh, no, I, I agree with you that, yes, like in my household, I've got six brothers. They never went to jail, but I did. But, and again, we were from a challenging background. But the simple fact is, is that it all, poverty can impact on us in, in different ways. But I felt at the end of the day, prison did me no good. Because, first of all, I went in there for six weeks and I came back out, and I came back out a more career criminal when I came out, mm. doing much more severe things. And I really won't wish that, wish that on my worst enemy. I feel that there's got to be other um, ways, whether so, you call it soft, but any kind of sanction where you have to give up your weekends or whatever doing community work is an imp it, it, it impose a burden onto you. And that could be a learning for people just as a first introduction into the criminal mm. justice system. I believe that if you are from a disadvantaged background, that you should be given greater uh, um, um, thought before you're, you're, you're sent to jail, you know, as, mm. as a person who come from a privileged background. That's my take on it. Well, Harriet, final word think, to you. I, sorry, I think it's a pity you're not on the sentencing council, frankly. Than some of these these <laughs> the people who are, but the um the other thing the sentencing council uh, says is is uh, councils of disadvantage is poor schooling, and I know myself from you know numerous people that I've met and interviewed and befriended that one of the key things that pushes especially young boys into crime pushes them to drop out of school at the ages of thirteen and fourteen and into crime is not learning to read. But instead of making that an excuse later on, why aren't we actually doing something about teaching them to read in the first place? Mm. Well, really interesting to get both of your perspectives on this. Harriet Sargent and Ken Hines, great to speak to you both. I think there's a little bit of agreement there towards yeah. the end. Well, I think, I think actually Ken was making a really sensible point. What's the point? of sending someone to prison for a month or two, where they'll just meet other criminals, mm. perhaps get more uh, knowledge of the criminal underworld and be, be a more hardened criminal at the end of it. But... It's a different issue, that, isn't it? There's no reason that that wouldn't apply to someone from a yeah. well-off background or a, or a poorly-off background. I mean... Yeah. It, 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 Slightly that, different not, point. That's Slightly an argument different. against sending so many people to prison for such a short time, which I think I agree with. Hmm. Well, coming up, the president of Argentina says he will establish a roadmap towards the UK handing over the sovereignty of the Falkland Islands. What could such a roadmap look like? Let's get your news headlines. Good afternoon from the newsroom. I'm Sam Francis. Uh, just coming up to 34 minutes past one. Rishi Sunak has been told to reassess whether the UK is breaking international law by continuing to sell arms to Israel. More than 600 legal experts, including three former Supreme Court judges, have written to the Prime Minister, citing what they call the plausible risk of genocide in Gaza. That letter was sent after three British men were among seven aid workers killed in an Israeli airstrike. The Prime Minister says that Britain could pull out of the European Convention on Human Rights if it obstructs the government's Rwanda plan. Rishi Sunak says controlling illegal migration is more important than membership of the ECHR and that he would not let what he called the foreign courts interfere in sovereign matters. British farmers are calling for a guaranteed basic income after post-Brexit arrangements left many worse off. At least 100 have joined a campaign group urging the government to help cover basic costs after the loss of subsidies from the European Union. It comes as suppliers warn of higher prices and possible empty supermarket shelves due to a new post-Brexit border charge, which will be introduced at the end of the month. And air passengers face yet another year of limits on liquids in their carry-on luggage. Several British airports will miss a June deadline to introduce new high-tech 3D scanners, which were supposed to end the need to remove things like laptops and liquids on flights. It means the 100 milliliter limit on liquids will remain for now, despite long-promised changes allowing up to two litres. For the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts. You can scan the code on your screen or visit our website, gbnews.com slash alerts.
For a valuable legacy your family can own, gold coins will always shine bright. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Here's a look at the markets this afternoon. The pound will buy you $1.2654 and €1.1660. The price of gold is currently £1,806.33 per ounce. And the FTSE 100 is at 7,973 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Hello and welcome to the latest forecast for GB News from the Met Office. A lot of cloud today and there will be showers for many of us as well, particularly in the south, further north. It's going to stay cold with this east to northeasterly wind as low pressure moves away. A weak weather front bringing a legacy of cloudy skies for much of the country. Some decent bright spells for the northwest of Scotland and the southeast of England, but in between a few showers, especially for the north of Scotland, where those showers will be falling as snow over the hills. And across central and southern England, Wales, where the showers will be heavy at times, particularly early afternoon. Feeling quite warm away from the showers in the south, 16 or 17 Celsius, a stark contrast further north. Northern England, Scotland, Northern Ireland feeling cold. And with that cold air in place, we're going to see a band of rain move north overnight. And that's going to be falling as snow over the hills of northern England and then eventually across southern and central Scotland. Some significant snow by dawn. Also some significant rain at lower levels, particularly through the central belt, could cause some issues. A wet start for many places, mild in the south, windy with that as well, with these bands of rain moving through. But that significant snow there across central and increasingly northern Scotland could cause some issues with uh, 20 centimetres or so building up over higher routes. Now, as we go into the afternoon, uh, brighter spells and blustery showers form in the south, further spells of rain for Northern Ireland, Scotland and Northern England, where it will stay on the cold side. The latest GB News travel. Hello, I'm Jules Buckley. Let's go to Cheshire firstly and the eastbound side of the M56 part blocked 14 to 12. That's Helsby to Rancorn and slow going. It's at the scene of an accident. No investigation work continues on the anti-clockwise M25. And as a result, the carriageway anti-clock is shut from junction 6 to 5. That's Godstone toward the M26 turn off. Long keys back to the M23 at 7 and diverting from junction 6 on the A25 past Oxted, Westrum and Sunridge. Three miles of queues past the Clackett Lane services too on the clockwise side. And in Chilham and Kent, the A252 is currently closed both ways between Melbury Hill and the A28 Ashford Road in this queuing. And that is all due to an ongoing collision there being dealt with. And for now, that's your latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Good afternoon, Britain. It's coming up to 20 to 2. And uh, goodness me, that debate on sentencing did get you talking. Mark has written in to say, uh, with regard to your discussion regarding softer jail terms for the less privileged, I was trying to read that out without doing the introduction, but I couldn't think quickly enough. Um, I feel current mitigation no. allows the judge to consider appropriate sentencing. However, being very wealthy affords you the opportunity of engaging the very best counsel. That's something we didn't touch in, upon. That's a good point. Rich people getting good lawyers. That's a good point. That's a good point. Mm. Donna says, I totally disagree with Ken. We should all be treated equally, regardless of our background, income, race, creed, colour, etc., etc. And that includes punishment, she says. We all learn at some point in early life the difference between right and wrong. If some groups are, given, are going to be given more lenient sentences, then the deterrent for that group becomes less effective, resulting in more crime. Yes, that's, that's a very good point, mm. actually. 
And Barbara says, uh, I'm with you, Tom. So thank you, Barbara. Um, she says, I'm the eldest of nine children, poor in the sight of many, but rich in love and moral high standards from my parents. I would not even think of stealing. And I think that is a really important point in all of this conversation. Um, saying just because someone's poor, they're more likely to steal is... is uh, is a, is a soft bigotry, mm. what we were talking about earlier, the bigotry of low expectations. Barbara, what was it like uh, growing up as one of nine? Yes. I imagine that was quite difficult, although lots of love, as you say. Mm. Um, it must be nice having such a massive family. Andrea says, what if the person against whom the crime is committed is from a disadvantaged background? Would that cancel this proposal out? Or would a privileged sex offender, for example, get a harsher sentence for preying on someone less fortunate? That's very interesting, and that's something that Harriet Sargent uh, mm. touched upon. She said uh, that would be a little... Uh, a, a bit of a... Um, inconsistency, wouldn't it? Yeah, I'm just imagining the sort of spider diagrams that we're <laughs> creating, sort of on the sliding scales of wealth, plotting one against the other. It gets enormously complicated incredibly quickly. Yes, it's a crime worse if you happen to be privileged. And how do you measure the wealth? Hmm? I mean, is it income? Is it, is it wealth? <laughs> oh, that's really getting is into it, the nitty-gritty. Is it richness in love? Richness in love. Yes, you can be rich and have no love. And no morals. Uh, and be a total psychopath, actually. Speaking of total psychopaths, the president of Argentina has reignited... I'm, you I'm, love him. I'm, I'm you actually, love I actually him. quite like Javier Malay, so um, I just thought it was quite a fun segue. Um, but the president of Argentina has reignited the seemingly never-ending row over the Falklands by promising a new roadmap for his country's takeover of South Atlantic islands. Yes, so speaking on the 42nd anniversary of the Argentinian invasion of the Falklands, Javier Malay added that best the best tribute to Argentines who lost their lives would be to defend the unwavering claim for Argentinian sovereignty over the islands. However, a spokesman for our Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, responded by saying the issue had been decisively settled some time ago. Well, let's get the thoughts now of Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Crawford, defence analyst and former British Army officer. Uh, Stuart Crawford. Stuart, um, what do you suspect this roadmap might look like? Would this be a full-scale invasion or a more diplomatic route? Uh, good afternoon. Um, I think that uh, the roadmap is probably uh, in his head and in his head only at the moment. Um, uh, uh, the president is no stranger to outlandish statements, uh, some of which, uh, as Tom has alluded, make, seem to make sense to me. But um, a roadmap to uh, return the uh, Falkland Islands, or Malvinas, as he would call them, to Argentina by the end of his presidency seems to be a, a, a fantasy too far. Um, and I don't think uh, at the moment that there's any prospect of um, a, a military invasion or anything like that like we had in 1982. And the only route would be through diplomacy. And as Lord Cameron said just the other day, yet again, uh, the Falklands will remain British until the Falkland Islanders themselves decide that they don't want to, to be British citizens anymore. Yes, and it is important to remember that in the uh, referendum, the national referendum held in the Falkland Islands in 2013, uh, it was over 99% in favour of remaining British. Just three people, just three people voted against the prospect. That's 0.0, .0 whatever three. it was. <laughs> um, but, but, Stuart, is there... Is there perhaps something that a lot of media is missing in this entire conversation, in that Javier Malay within Argentina is under a lot of pressure from opposition politicians, saying, why aren't you more fervently in favour of taking these islands? Because Malay is someone who has praised Margaret Thatcher in the past, and so all of the left-wing politicians in Argentina say, aha, you're not a real patriot, you're not a real Argentine because you praised Margaret Thatcher. So, so he's almost pressured into taking this position. Uh, I think that's absolutely right. Um, it's uh, uh, um, a favourite aspiration, if you like, of uh, Argentinian politicians to re recover the, the Falkland Islands. And I think that, to a certain extent, Malay has been forced into making that sort of tub-thumping, um, arousing uh, speech, if you like, on the anniversary of the 1982 invasion. But the truth of the matter is that Argentina does not have the military force that it had back then. Um, and I know that they are about to purchase 24 F-16 jet fighters from Denmark um, uh, with the blessing of the US. 
who have the final say in where those U.S. manufactured jets go. And the reason that the United States has done that is to prevent China uh, being the provider of jets to mm. the South American, that South American country. So there's, there's a lot of global politics involved in this as well. But in terms of military invasion, I don't think there's any chance of that in the near future. Mm. Well, that's a relief. Thank you very much for putting our minds at ease this afternoon. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Crawford, always great to speak to you. Mm. Ah, really important. Well, there you go. We, really can, all, we can all sleep that, tonight. That Argentina is actually moving out of the orbit of the Russias and the Chinas of mm. this world. There's a, an organisation called BRICS, which is um, Brazil, India, Russia, China, and there are going to be a whole host of new countries joining it, including Argentina. One of the first things Javier Malay did when he became president was saying, no, thank you, not going to join with China. Not going to join with Russia. We want to be part of the Western Alliance. He's your libertarian icon, isn't he, Tom? <laughs> you love this, his chainsaw. Uh, his chainsaw is great. <laughs> uh, more politicians should have chainsaws. <laughs> Coming up, is being made to work on Saturdays, despite requesting them off for childcare reasons, sexual discrimination. Hmm, more on that soon. Britain's Newsroom. Weekday mornings from 9.30. Is it OK to call people fat? I won't call Bev fat because she isn't. She <laughs> won't call me fat because I'm not. But the fitness fanatic, Derek Evans, you might know him better as 90s icon, Mr Motivator, recently he's told a podcast, diabetes have gone through the roof. You should be able to call people fat. Well, he joins us now. Good morning, Derek. Good morning. Good morning. Great to see you. So I think what you're getting you. at is this idea that we've become so polite about weight that we're ignoring the elephant in the room. Um, if you'll forgive the <laughs> forgive the phraseology there, and actually sure. sometimes you've got to be cruel to be kind. Well, actually, you know, this has been taken out of all context. I actually didn't say you're entitled to call people fat. What I did say is that in the 80s and 90s, I remember the way I got into television, there was a gentleman walking at reception while I was waiting for the people I was training. And for some reason, I got up and I prodded him in the belly. And I said to him, you need to deal with that. That was fat. We have a nation where obesity, diabetes is killing every one of us. Mm. And unless we take responsibility for our health, rather than waiting for government to do this, government to do that, it is our responsibility, right, to look after our independence and our health. And as we get older, it's even more critical, right? And that's why I'm here as an example saying to you, listen, I'm 71 years of age and movement is medicine. And you can't sit around watching television and not going out to the gym or wherever, you will never ever be able to look after your family and everything you've worked for, you will lose it. I've never seen a hearse, uh, sorry, a deposit account behind a hearse. Mm. I've ne no matter what you work for, the most important thing you can do with your life is every hour, do something active, every hour. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Just coming up to 10 to 2. And an employment judge has rejected a woman's claims that she was being discriminated against on the basis of sex by London Underground. Why? She was being to work 
being paid to work on Saturdays, despite requesting these days off for childcare reasons. Yes, yeah, so she thought, oh, I've got a case here. Sexism! <laughs> well, the tribunal said there's no evidence a hypothetical male would have been treated any differently at all. However, she was awarded £2,700 in compensation as it was found the company did not act reasonably in the way it dealt with her request. So she got a little bit of cash. I think this is what you could make any spurious claim against your employer and get almost three grand I just think... to, like because they're not sort of I don't know talking in a dull tone or whatever. I think that's how it works these days. Goodness yes, me. Well, joining us now to discuss this is the journalist and author Ella Whelan. Um, Ella, it was a pretty audacious claim this that uh, time off was not granted, therefore, it must be sexism. Well, it's quite an interesting case because, um, while I think that the ruling is probably correct there's no evidence that a man would have been treated differently um we know that it is women who pick up most of the childcare responsibilities um whether that's you know being the one who has to leave for the doctor's appointment or to pick up your kid when they inevitably are sick m most of the time from nursery um so it kind of raises an interesting question about um about women in the workplace and I, th I actually think it's not the issue of her getting a couple of grand for um them handling it badly um isn't the thing that it's not the thing that interests me the thing that interests me is you know the question of how can women organize their working life alongside their family life this woman been working in um this particular depot for a, year, for a, a long time, she wasn't a newbie and had an uh, arrangement with her bosses about specifically about childcare because her partner was a bus driver, which, you know, had been working well for a long time and come to an end. So I don't begrudge her trying to do something about it. That's interesting. The inter Sorry, go on. The, go on. The, the interesting thing is, um, you know, childcare and that whole row is going to be big in the next, in this upcoming election. And the government has to de has to decide what it wants from women because there's two two kind of lines coming out. On the one hand, there's very little support um, for for women organising their lives in the workplace around childcare. I mean, there's this whole row about the, the new sort of thirty hours funded. You don't have to be a Labour Party supporter to know that <laughs> their claims that this is going to fail are true. I mean, nurseries are shutting all around me, all around everyone. Um, there just simply isn't enough supply to meet the demand. Um, so the childcare issue is a big one. But also, you know, we've just had a really massively irritating campaign um, come out of NHS supported by government ministers um, telling specifically women most of the time that they have to spend every single second with their baby or else they'll get mental health issues in later life. Um, Andrea Leadsom saying that they are 1,001 days between pregnancy, not even when the baby's out, but pregnancy and um, your know, second year mm. are sort of priceless. So pick one. Are yeah. women meant to be in work and forget about the kids? Or are you meant to forget about work and be a 24-7 mum? That's very yeah, interesting. You know, it's not fair to pull us in two directions like Yeah, this. there are mixed messages because we've also got the likes of Miriam Cates, MP, talking about how important it is for women to have children and trying to think about ways in which the government can encourage women to have as many children as they would like to have. But, of course, there are many. And then, actually, sometimes in workplaces it is difficult for women. But do you think that employers should be told that they have to be lenient towards women with children? Can we possibly move towards that direction? Because that, that would worry me as well. What do you think? Well, look, I mean, I want to get to a situation in which it's not just mum's job to pick up all of the childcare slack. I mean, that's not something you can legislate for. That's not something that an individual employer can change. That's, that's a social expectation and norm that has to shift. Um, and the more we talk about it, the more it will hopefully shift. Men in our, my generation now are much more involved in family life and child rearing than our parents' generation or indeed our grandparents' generation. So those things are changing. But I mean, you could you could start by having free or at least extremely inexpensive high quality state provided childcare on a on a big national scheme in terms yeah. of But it's interesting you say this is this is that. about culture as well and how people in their own families work things out. So maybe men need to step up to the plate. Thank you, Ella. We're gonna have to leave it there, but great to talk to you, Ella Weenan uh, there, who is an author and journalist.
Well, the government keeps promising free yeah. childcare, but then they don't realise it's very expensive to deliver. And, and what's perhaps the worst thing here? These ratios where you're only allowed certain numbers of children per caregiver. These are some of the tightest ratios in England compared to even Scandinavian countries. But much more to come. Coming up, we'll be talking about the ECHR. Should we leave it? Stay with us. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello again and welcome to the GB News forecast with the Met Office. Further rain arrives overnight. It's going to stay cold in the north and as the rain moves into Scotland, there will be some disruptive snow over the hills north of the centre belt. A number of systems coming our way over the next few days. The next low brings spells of rain and hill snow across the UK. And then another low for the weekend. Storm Kathleen, named by Met Erin, because the strongest winds will be for the Republic of Ireland. But it will be blustery overnight, nevertheless, with some heavy rain in places. Those spells of rain particularly affecting northern and western parts of the country, although the far north of Scotland is staying clear of that, with a touch of frost in places. But it's across central Scotland where there's the risk of disruption as we start off Friday. Rain disruption for lower parts of the central belt and for higher parts of the central belt and into central Scotland the risk of some disruptive snow up to 10 centimetres or so above 300 metres could cause some issues first thing. That peters out through the day and it stays cold in northern Scotland but elsewhere it's a mild day, early rain clears to showers, some sunny spells in between the downpours with highs of 18 or even 19 Celsius towards the southeast. Another blustery day on Saturday. In fact, it becomes increasingly windy as heavy rain moves north across Scotland and Northern Ireland first thing, replaced by showers. Some sunshine in between the showers. The wind will be strong with the gusts of 50 to 70 miles an hour for Western Britain and Northern Ireland, but it will also be a warm wind, highs of 20 or 21 Celsius. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. You can win our biggest prize giveaway so far. First, there's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel gifts. For a chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other, which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 
Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Good afternoon, Britain. It's two o'clock on Thursday, the 4th of April. The nuclear option, Rishi Sunak has said he's prepared to withdraw from the European Convention on Human Rights if that's what it takes to stop the boats. Last night, he said controlling illegal immigration is more important than any foreign court. Do you believe him? Two-tier justice. British judges have been told to consider softening sentences for criminals if they happen to come from deprived or difficult backgrounds. Should poorer people spend less time behind bars? That coming up. And Falkland's threat, the new maverick president of Argentina, has announced his roadmap to seize control of the British Overseas Territory. Should we be worried? Do you think Rishi Sunak's serious about the ECHR, about leaving it or ignoring it or withdrawing our membership? There's two schools of thought here. Number only two? One, only two. I think there's there three. Are only, there are only two possible opinions. <laughs> OK, <laughs> right, go on, try us. <laughs> Number one, Rishi Sunak cares more about his next job, mm. uh, his globe-travelling, perhaps AI-regulating job after he leaves the House of Commons, after he loses the election. That's school of thought number one. School of thought number two is, actually, things are so desperate for the Tories. They want to avoid so desperately the 1997-style defeat that this poll that came out yesterday, this YouGov poll, pretty profound and large MRP poll, they want to avoid that outcome. And perhaps the only way to do that is to squeeze the reform vote. And the reform party is up to 13, 14, even 15 points in some polls now. Add that to the Tories and the gap goes from 20 to... Six, seven points. The That's... third school of thought is he's just saying what the Sun, what he thinks the Sun readers want to hear, the readers of the Sun newspaper, because that's what he was saying this to. Although he has said similar things in the past, but I do think this is probably the toughest he's sounded when it comes to the ECHR. He has previously seemed to tell us all that, no, we don't need to think about that because this bill will do the job. Mm. Others, Suella Braverman, Robert Jenrick, for example, have said, actually, if we don't, your bill is going to be a bit useless. Yes, well, it will be very, very interesting to see what actually happens. And mm. this is another, another reason why I think... We're not going to see a general election until we get a couple of flights off the ground and people off to Rwanda. Well, keep your views coming in. Do you think Rishi Sunak does have the bottle to take us out of the ECHR? Should he even, or would that be the wrong move? Let us know. GBviews at gbnews.com. But first, your headlines. Tom and Emily, thank you very much and good afternoon from the newsrooms just after two o'clock. And uh, I want to start with some breaking news that we're getting out of the West Midlands this afternoon, uh, that a woman has been arrested after a retired vet was allegedly mauled to death by dogs in his garden in Warwickshire. We understand that Anthony Harrington, Harrington who was 77, was found unconscious with severe bite injuries. Seven dogs were seized since that incident, including one that was believed to be Mr Harrington's pet, leading to the arrest of another 75-year-old woman. Warwickshire police have said they are continuing to investigate what they have described as that tragic incident. In other news, the Prime Minister says that Britain could pull out of the European Convention on Human Rights if it obstructs the government's Rwanda plan. Rishi Sunak says controlling illegal migration is more important than membership in the ECHR and he would not let what he called the foreign court interfere in sovereign matters. Labour has accused the Prime Minister of trying to appease the hard right of the Conservative Party. More than 600 British legal experts, including three former Supreme Court judges, are calling on the UK to stop selling arms to Israel. They say there's a plausible risk the weapons may be used to commit serious violations of international law 
and that the Prime Minister must change Britain's policy. Shadow Business Secretary Jonathan Reynolds says the government should publish the legal advice it's received on the UK's arrangements with Israel. The law of the UK is very, very clear. If there is any possibility of anything exported from the UK being involved in a serious violation of, of humanitarian law, it cannot be exported from the UK. So the government will have had legal advice on that specific to the conflict in Gaza. We've asked them to publish that legal advice. It would be, I think, a reasonable step, given what, what has happened in the last few days and what has happened over the last few months, to make clear the legal position and to make sure the government itself and we are currently complying with UK law. Well, we've heard today that Leicester City Council says sensitive information has been posted online by a known ransomware group after it was stolen in a cyber attack. The local authority was the victim of a hack last month and that forced it to shut down IT systems. It's now confirmed that confidential documents have been published by that group of hackers, including rent statements and ID details. The group is known to have also attacked a number of other government, education and healthcare organisations. And the National Cyber Security Centre is involved in the ongoing criminal investigation. British farmers are calling for a guaranteed basic income after post-Brexit arrangements left many worse off. At least 100 have joined a campaign group urging the government to help cover basic costs after the loss of subsidies from the European Union. Analysis last year by the organic farming group Riverford found that half of Britain's fruit and vegetable growers may go out of business within just a year. And it comes as suppliers are warning of higher prices and empty supermarket shelves due to a new post-Brexit border charge, which will be introduced at the end of the month. Judges have been told to consider more lenient sentences for offenders from deprived or difficult backgrounds. The Sentencing Council, which sets guidelines for judges and magistrates, has for the first time outlined mitigating factors that it says courts should consider before handing down a sentence. Those factors include poverty, low education, discrimination and insecure housing. But critics say the law should treat everyone equally, with the Justice Secretary Alec Chalk describing those guidelines as patronising and, he says, inaccurate. The French president says that he has no doubt that Russia will target the Paris Olympics this summer, threatening the security of the Games. Emmanuel Macron was speaking during an event in Paris earlier for the inauguration of the new Olympics Aquatic Centre in Paris. Russian and Belarusian athletes are set to compete as so-called neutral participants in the Games this summer amid tensions following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Strong winds and heavy rain are set to hit parts of Britain this weekend as Storm Kathleen rolls in, the 11th named storm in just 18 months, eight months rather. Gusts of up to 70 miles an hour are expected on Saturday along the west coast of England, with 50 mile an hour winds also expected in other areas. The Met Office is urging people to take care, with coastal areas also expecting to see large waves. And finally, before we head back to Tom and Emily, the world's oldest man has died just two months before he would, could you believe it, have celebrated his 115th birthday. Juan Vicente Perez was born in Venezuela in 1909, nearly 20 years before the first radio station started broadcasting there. While there were six British monarchs during his long lifetime and 20 US presidents, his death was announced by the governor of the region where he lived, who described him as a humble, hard-working and peaceful man. For the latest stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan the code on your screen or go to gbnews.com alerts. Good afternoon, Britain. It is 2.08. Now, the Prime Minister has hinted at ripping up the UK's international obligations to get Rwanda flights off the ground and, indeed, stop the boats. That's his plan. Speaking to The Sun newspaper, Rishi Sunak said that controlling illegal immigration is more important than our membership of any foreign court. But he sidestepped a question on whether he would pledge to leave the ECHR in its entirety in his next election manifesto. Mm. Well, we can now get the thoughts of political correspondent at The Spectator, James Heal. What do you make of this, what Rishi Sunak said and what he didn't quite say? 
Well, that was interesting. I mean, I know there's a live debate within the Conservative Parliamentary Party and also in Rishi Sunak's own Downing Street team about whether or not there ought to be something like this uh, withdrawing from the European Court of Human Rights in the next Tory manifesto uh, and a sort of way to kind of replicate in 2019 that sense of anti-establishment forces, of proving that they're on the side of people who want to take migration seriously. And of course, it's an area of which with the Labour Party uh, is very much aligned with the legal establishment. So there's a kind of political argument here, which is that if you have it as a live issue, as a real debate, and you pledge that in a manifesto, that might be able to attract back some of those 2016 uh, Leave voters who have now deserted the party, uh, having seen where the Conservatives are doing over the last few years. So it's an attempt to kind of replicate that 2019 get Brexit done factor. Uh, but I will be, I wait to see if it actually comes out with that, because there's a minority of the parliamentary party, uh, about hundreds or so One Nation territorial MPs, have already made it very clear that they don't want this in any manifesto. Yeah, the last 2019 Conservative manifesto had a unified position on Brexit. All the MPs agreed with it. They were made to sign something before saying they will vote for the deal after so many deal defeats in Parliament in the preceding months. Uh, I wonder, that was such a live issue that was the forefront of political debate and that most people in the country, almost everyone in the country, had an opinion on. The ECHR doesn't seem to be mm. at that position in terms of the forefront of debate. Political anoraks really care about it. But to the average voter on the street, is it necessarily at the forefront of what they're thinking about? I quite agree with you, Tom. Um, and I think you've got to remember, of course, that that election was forced around an actual democratic mandate, which was the 2016 result. And we had a big vote. 17.4 million people have voted leaving that. This is a very different, sort of, as you're saying there, quite a sort of esoteric debate in some ways about international I don't know, law. actually, because if you phrased it in such a way, leave the ECHR to deport foreign criminals or leave the ECHR to uh, stop the boats... It, that, you can see be, how it could mobilise a seen, lot of seen as public a opinion. Question, though. No, but if it was presented in that mm. way, not specifically as a question, but if it was presented by the politicians in mm. such a way, mm. I mean, people did that with Brexit. Vote Brexit to stop immigration. Vote Brexit I don't think to any get politicians cheaper goods. Said stop, stop immigration. Okay, it's not stop immigration to reduce immigration. Control you see what I mean, James? You see what I mean, I, James? I, you could I, phrase it in such a way that people would think, oh yes, absolutely. Absolutely right, and I completely agree with you there. I think what I'm saying was that we had that referendum and then the election followed after that. And so there was a very simple thing, which was even the Tories who didn't like Brexit, and there were some Tory Remainers, you know, still are in the party today, um, they said, hands up, you know, we lost that fight and we're willing to go along with that. This one, uh, I'm not so sure that... Uh, how the whole thing would shake out. And there isn't that kind of totemic referendum. We haven't had that yet. So I think for that reason, Tories feel a lot more sceptical about it. The other thing as well, Emily, of course, you've got to remember the elephant in the room here, is about the Good Friday Agreement. And that is written into law. The ECHR membership is a part of that. Do the Tories really want to go and open the kind of Pandora's box of all of that again, particularly when they won the last election on getting Brexit done? And hang on a second, are we going to spend years negotiating with Europe once again and getting into issues around the Irish Sea border and Good Friday Agreement, et cetera? And for that reason, I think that's the kind of things stopping it. Final reason, I'd say, as well, Rishi Sunak, of course, came into office and sold himself as a deal maker. He was someone who got uh, the Windsor Framework up and running, who signed negotiations with Europe, uh, America, et cetera, CPTPP. Does he really want to kind of go against all of that and be what Boris Johnson was, which was kind of anti-international community, very happy to kind of rile up tensions, have a fight with the international community. Uh, I'm a bit more sceptical of that. I think by his temperament, by his politics, and by his relatively weak political position, those mm. are all facts against Rishi Sunak backing this kind of move. Yeah, I think that's right. And yet, and yet right. the, the, the direct quote last night was, uh, he wouldn't let any foreign court get in the way of controlling migration into this country or controlling illegal migration into this country. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that he would be committed to leaving it. He could, as previous prime ministers, as previous rules-based prime ministers have done, ignore a ruling of the ECHR. After all, that's what David Cameron did on one occasion. Yes, he could actually do that. There's also, you know, before the nuclear option of pulling out, I think the UK government is exploring different ways in which it can kind of find legal mechanisms to overcome those Strasbourg uh, injunctions. So we're not at that stage yet. The other thing, of course, Tom, is that he could put it in a manifesto, um, well aware that he looks likely to lose and uh, lose, but less badly, but then he won't have to actually go ahead with this commitment. Um, the interesting thing for me will be in an election campaign is whether we see a bit like 1997, when some Tory MPs completely defiled the party and sort of made up their own policy on the on the euro which was the big thing at the time and you had dozens of tory candidates including i believe david cameron future prime minister basically say whatever john major says we're going to commit to vote against the euro and so you could see in this campaign people going 
you know, whatever the prime minister says, I want to pull out the ECHR and I'm going to make that my own manifesto pledge in their local election leaflets. So um, that's something to watch, I think, perhaps. But uh, it's certainly the big um, news line out of the Prime Minister's interview. And I think that shows that the Tory MPs are now currently thinking, what do we actually have control over? We can't turn around the economy quickly. This is the thing we've got the most likely mm. chance of actually law. Yes, I think that's right. Thank you very much indeed, James Hill, political correspondent at The Spectator. Always great to get your analysis on such topics. I don't think he's got it in him. I don't think it would fit with mm. his politics. I think that's... Main point, no, isn't I think, it? With I think Rishi Sunak's politics. Right but, um. Um, but I do think what James said there, that individual MPs, like in 1997, how individual Conservative MPs said we're against the EU even though the party wasn't at that place at that time, could it be that individual Conservative MPs put out their own individual manifestos on this issue? Well, why don't we ask one? <laughs> <laughs> We're joining us now is the Conservative Member of Parliament for Shipley, Philip Davies. Uh, Philip, do you think you or your colleagues might put their own communications out on issues such as the ECHR that might differentiate or differ from the main party? Uh, well, possibly. It wouldn't be the first time I've done that. I've, I think I do that as every election, to be perfectly honest. So, uh, look, I've always, I've always been against our membership of the uh, European Convention on Human Rights. It's a complete waste of time and the court's a joke, to be perfectly honest. Um, I, I don't actually think this this is is, is massive news actually about the prime minister. Uh, it's not. It's certainly not a shock because if anyone looks at the front of the Rwanda bill, um, it, any bill that the government brings forward, it has to make a commitment that it's in, it, that it complies with the European Convention of Human Rights. Every bill has this certification on it before it's brought before the House of Commons. On the Rwanda bill, I'll read you what it says on the front of the Rwanda bill. It actually says. Uh, Secretary James Cleverley has made the following statement. Um, I am unable to make a statement that, in my view, the provisions of the Safety of Rwanda Asylum and Immigration Bill are compatible with the Convention rights, but the government nevertheless wishes the House to proceed with the bill. So the government's already making clear that, it, in its view, the Rwanda Bill is outside of the scope of the European Convention of Human Rights, but it's cracking on with it anyway. So. I think the Prime Minister has already, already made it clear that he's not going to let the mm. European Convention of Human Rights stop him dealing with illegal immigration. That's a very good point. Uh, we were speaking to Stephen Pound, the former Labour MP, a little earlier in the show, and he was saying it wouldn't make the blindest bit of difference, really, to the Rwanda deportation plan getting out of the ECHR. He said it's our courts that are holding it up. Yeah, and, 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 that's, and that's true. And, and Tom made the very good point earlier that actually we can just um, ignore the rulings from the European uh, Court of Human Rights. We've got no mechanism for enforcing them. And perhaps we should be a bit more robust in doing that when they make stupid decisions as they regularly do. So, yeah, look, I, I don't really think this is uh, massive news. But, but you know, look, I mean, I, I'm against the European Court of Human Rights. I think it's a joke court. We'd be better off out of it. But I don't think it's the be all and end all in terms of dealing with illegal immigration. Mm. And you might yourself put out a communication at the election saying that uh, that you personally believe in in withdrawing. Yeah, well, I've always I've always made that clear. I'm, I've never mm. hidden that view. Uh, so I'm quite right. happy to well, reiterate well, well, it. We did we did originally. I'm quite happy to reiterate it to anyone who asks. Let's 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 move on to this other big issue of today, though, because the Sentencing Council has suggested that judges should consider softer sentences for offenders from deprived or what they describe as challenging backgrounds. Should we soften up sentences for people uh, based on the basis of their birth? Now, this is this is completely unacceptable, uh, Tom. It's an, it's an absolute outrage, to be perfectly honest. You've got 15 unelected, unaccountable members of the Sentencing Council, in effect the great and the good of the liberal uh, elite in the, in the legal profession, in effect deciding themselves on, on no basis whatsoever that they've decided that for a whole swathe of the population, they can now get lighter sentences if you've experienced discrimination and you've had a negative experience of authority. I mean, what on earth does that mean? You know, basically, if you if you got told off by your teachers when you were 10 years old, does that mean you get a lighter sentence now, mm. that you, you know, an earlier experience of being a looked-after child? I mean, as, as people know, Esther was in care for uh, the first part of her life. Should she get softer sentences because of that, uh, because she commits a crime now? It's... All these things, they're patronising 
and they're completely unacceptable. And uh, and I, I, they, they've lost the plot, these people at the Sentencing Council. Well, you're not the only one to hit back. Alex Chalk, the uh, Justice Secretary, of course, he said the guidance is patronising too. He said it's inaccurate, risks making poor schooling and poverty excuses for offenders to commit further crimes. Do you think that this could almost encourage people to commit crimes? They might get a lesser sentence. Yeah, well, look, I, I, I put in an objection to these proposals when, during the consultation, as did Alex Chalk, which they've completely ignored. But, yes, I mean, you, you make a good point there, there, Emily, that actually this mitigation can be used every time somebody commits a crime. Even if it's the 35th time they've appeared in court, this mitigation will still be able to be used every single time. And it would apply to every crime as well. I mean, there are some people, I don't happen to agree with them, there are some people who say, well, look, if you're if you're in deprivation and you commit shoplifting, that might be a mitigation that should be taken into consideration. I mean, I don't think it should, but some people might make that case. This applies to every single crime you commit. You know, you go along and stab somebody with a knife or you, you rape somebody, you can use the fact that you, you live in deprivation or you had a negative experience of authority when you were younger to get, to get a, a lighter sentence on the back of it. This is completely nuts. And, and these are political decisions, not legal decisions. And I would say to the 15 members of the Sentencing Council, many of them judges and, and lawyers, you know, if they want to pursue this kind of policy, they can actually stand for election like the rest of us and make their argument to the electorate not try and sneak in their left-wing political views through the back door because of the position that they've got. These are not people speaking as lawyers. They're speaking as lefties who are trying to pursue their own political agenda, and it's, <laughs> it's outrageous. And yet, Philip, the Sentencing Council was established in 2010, albeit from the Labour government that legislated for it, but it was officially started working in 2010. If the Conservatives had been so irritated by this sort of structure that once Sir Keir Starmer himself sat upon and made rules through, if the Conservatives are really upset by these sort of liberal lawyers making all of these rules, why don't you change the structure? Why don't you abolish the Sentencing Council? Why don't we go back to how it was done before the Labour Party changed the rules? Yeah, I agree with you, Tom. I'd, I'd abolish the Sentencing Council tomorrow. Uh, to be perfectly honest, I might have that on my election uh, literature <laughs> as well, uh, just, uh, just to go the whole hog. But yeah, they, but I think this is massive overreach. I mean, we, they've never they've never gone this far before. It, well, you're right. It, this was a Blairite creation in 2003. It changed its name, in effect, in, in 2010 from the Sentencing Guidelines Council to the Sentencing Council. That's all it yeah. did, really, was change its name. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, th this is completely unacceptable. This is complete overreach. Uh, and, um, I, you know, it, it, unless they get back down from this, I, I do genuinely think we are going to have to look at um abolition of the sentencing council because this is this is not acceptable in a in a democracy for people unelected and unaccountable to be making these kind of political decisions. Well there you go. Thank you very much indeed. Philip Davies, always great to speak to you, MP for Shipley. Um it's interesting because we were discussing oh maybe this is because of practical issues, we have overcrowding in our prisons, more lenient sentences mm. might free up more space. But actually Philip there saying this is very much ideological. The people on the sentencing council have a view of the world, have a view of what makes a criminal have a view on, you know, perhaps sociology, psychology, et cetera, et cetera, making excuses. It's one of these quasi-autonomous non-government organisations or quangos that seem to just run everything in Britain right now. Mm. It's, it's, it, doesn't almost, it almost doesn't matter who you elect because actually the people that decide Treasury policy are the OBR. Actually, people that decide sentencing policy are the Sentencing Council. Actually, in just about every corner of government policy, there's some arm's length body that's deciding everything. And the politicians we elect sit there helpless. Well, some Conservatives say, oh, there needs to be a march back through the institutions what they say. Mm. Anyway, coming up, a funeral director's in Hull is under investigation. One man is accusing them of giving him the wrong ashes. This is quite incredible. We're going to bring you the very latest after this short break. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6 a.m. Do you mind if I ask you a little bit about Sebastian? Um, I just, it really amazes me how a mother um, who can lose a child in such a shocking and unexpected way, so little, so precious, can then turn that grief into something so positive. How did you find the strength to get up 
um, get a camera crew, as you say, travel to the other side of the world and investigate all of this? Um, I was angry at Sebastian for dying. Um, you know, you feel like saying, God, I, yeah, 32 years later and I can still get very, very upset about it. I was angry that something that, that while he while he was born and lived with me and slept and then died, they were actively campaigning in New Zealand to try and stop this happening because they had a very high cot death rate there. Um, they had the, the, the lady, uh, the Anne Diamond, if you like, of uh, New Zealand, a, a television presenter called Judy Bailey, went on telly every night and said, if you're just about to put your baby down to sleep, put him on his or her back, not the tummy, and this will help. And there, cot death rate plummeted. And I went out to New Zealand and met her, and it was anger that drove me to come back and demand that we have the same advert here, um, the same campaign. And, of course, I got all this complete nonsense from the Department of Health saying, you know, oh, young mothers do not watch television, I was told. In other words, while New Zealand mums were being told how to save their babies lives we actively denied british mums that advice wow. during the time that sebastian and others were dying and, and the other point i suppose to make is it's helpful to educate all generations because when i think when i had my mm. babies my mum would say oh, he's not settling just stick him on his tummy he'll be much happier that's what we did with you and we had to say well things have changed mm. and you know yes. th but it's about educating everybody because it's not everybody. just the mums Everybody's that get their hands on the babies your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. In the GB newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Right, it's 2.26. You're watching and listening to Good Afternoon Britain. Now, very shortly, there is due to be a press conference about the investigation into legacy funeral directors. Yeah, this is an extraordinary story. Last month, police arrested two people, removed 35 bodies from the funeral directors over concerns about the storage and management processes at this Hull-based firm. Now, why precisely did they remove 35 bodies? Well... The story is extraordinary. Here to tell us more is the Yorkshire and Humber reporter for GB News, Anna Riley. Uh, Anna, ahead of this press conference, just remind us about the, the gruesome details here. Yes, well, good afternoon. Uh, this press conference is being held by Humberside Police. Uh, almost a month on since investigations first started into legacy funeral directors, few... Uh, material has actually been released. We've not heard that much. We do know um, that 35 bodies and a quantity of ashes were removed from the firm's Hesel Road branch in Hull and moved to another mortuary. There was a, a cordon around there um, and also the two other branches on Annleby Road in Hull and also their branch in Beverly. Uh, following police investigations, we know that a 46-year-old man and a 23-year-old woman were arrested on suspicion of prevention of a lawful and decent burial, fraud by false representation and fraud by abuse of position. They have been released on bail as police investigations continue. And police have also set up a helpline as well for families that they uh, believe that have been affected by this case. They've received more than 1,500 calls since that was set up. But as far as we know, it's 35 bodies that were removed from the mortuary and a quantity of ashes. And people have spoken to the media as well, grieving families. Um, one gentleman believes that it wasn't his wife's ashes that were given to him after the funeral. Another woman spoke out to the media and said that she believed she kissed an empty 
empty coffin of her loved one and didn't believe that their body was in there. But we may hear more uh, in this press conference as to more information um, being released. Most recently, a winding up uh, petition has been issued against the funeral company uh, over a significant unpaid council debt. The um, the council, Hull City Council, say that legacy independent funeral directors owe the authority more than £51,000 for unpaid charges, including cremation fees, and that became apparent in February 2023. And of course, there's been an outpouring of grief from the community as well after hearing some of the scant facts of this case of what has happened. Floral tributes have been laid in the Hesel Road branch of the funeral parlour. Uh, vigil has been held as well at Hull Minster and this is something that's really shocked the community as to, to what has happened you know of course uh, it's a tragic time isn't it when you lose a loved one and you want them to be given the best care possible when they're being put with the funeral director um, we know that the MP as well for uh, Hull West and Hesel, Emma Hardy, has said that affected families would not have to pay for another funeral with the cost being picked up by the local authority using funds given by the government. So uh, that should be imminent, mm. half past two, that um, press conference that's been held by Humberside Police. So we'll bring that live and we'll see what the most recent update is from the police. Thank you very much, Anna. I mean, these are pretty grim allegations. Do we understand why? We're going to be going to the press conference when it begins, but do we understand why we're having this press conference at this particular moment? No, Emily, we don't. Um, we've asked the police haven't given that information. You know, we, we could surmise that as it been nearly one month on, and of course it's been a high profile case uh, nationwide, not just for people that live in Hull and East Yorkshire, that the police may be giving an update on the case, uh, maybe an update into other families that may be affected, maybe reaching out. We know the council's going to speak as well, so they may be giving more support to people affected, um, you know, who, who don't want to be faced with another funeral cost. So we don't know exactly what it is yet. It could be an update nearly one month on and then hearing from the council as well as to the support that they're giving these families that have been affected. Yes, Anna, this must have been such a traumatic time for the dozens of families, many of whom don't know if it was their loved one who was put to rest, their loved one at that funeral, their loved one uh, whose ashes they received. This is obviously incredibly traumatic for many people. Let's hope that we hear some answers from the police uh, when that press conference gets going. But for now, Anna Riley, thank you very much for joining us uh, live from, uh, from, from outside the, the police station. I mean, just imagine thinking you've got the ashes of a loved one. You're already totally bereaved and then not knowing actually if they are the ashes of, of the person that you've lost. It's quite yeah. incredible. Or, or um, not knowing if your loved one is one of these bodies that was left in the funeral directors. It, it's extraordinary, this story. There are a few things more distressing, I imagine. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to bring you that press conference when it begins, but a British farmers' campaign for a basic income to cope with post-Brexit struggles. Should farmers be given a basic income and has Brexit hit them hard? Good afternoon from the GB newsroom, just after half past two. And I'll start with some breaking news uh, that we've heard in the last few minutes into the newsroom here, that a man has been found guilty of murdering a police officer 19 years ago. PC Sharon Beshenivsky was murdered by Piran Dita Khan during an armed robbery in 2005. He was today found guilty at Leeds Crown Court of her murder, murder of the 38-year-old who died in Bradford, and uh, he has been sentenced to imprisonment for life, the judge setting the minimum term. Detectives say that today's verdict is the culmination of 18 years of hard work in that case. The Prime Minister says that Britain could pull out of the European Convention on Human Rights if it obstructs the government's Rwanda plan. Rishi Sunak says that controlling illegal migration is more important than membership of the ECHR and that he would not let what he called the foreign court interfere in sovereign matters. Labour, though, accused the Prime Minister of trying to appease the hard right of his party. 
More than 600 British legal experts, including three former Supreme Court judges, are calling on the UK to stop selling arms to Israel. They say that there is a plausible risk that the weapons may be used to commit serious violations of international law and that the Prime Minister must change Britain's policy. British farmers are calling for a guaranteed basic income after post-Brexit arrangements left many worse off. At least 100 have joined a campaign group urging the government to help cover basic costs after the loss of subsidies from the European Union. It comes as suppliers warn of higher prices and empty supermarket shelves. Well, let's take you live now to a press conference taking place regarding the funeral home directors. Apologies faced by my investigators, and I know that this cannot have been easy for them. In full consultation with families and His Majesty's coroner, extensive work continues to formally identify the 35 deceased who were recovered from the Hesel Road site four weeks ago. As I'm sure you can appreciate, this is a lengthy process that has to follow the coroner's regulations, but when complete, it will provide families with an absolute assurance as to the identity of their loved ones so that repatriation to their families can take place. I remain committed to keeping bereaved families at the heart of this investigation. Therefore, these results will only be provided to the direct family members to ensure their privacy and dignity is maintained. Since the start of our investigation, a dedicated phone line has received over 2,000 calls from concerned members of the public. Of those, a significant number were, understandably, concerned about the identifi identification of ashes and of their loved ones. Having worked closely with forensic scientists and specialists to assess whether it was possible to extract DNA from the human ashes in order to identify them, Whilst the expert opinion provides us with an assurance that the proper crematorium processes have been followed, unfortunately, given the high temperature required to carry out cremation, the DNA will have been broken down and degraded to such a level that we would not be able to recover a meaningful DNA profile. This means that we are unable to attribute any of the human ashes or identify them. This will, of course, be devastating news for families and loved ones and you have my heartfelt condolences at this really difficult time. This weekend, officers from the investigation team have been in contact with over 700 families who raised concerns through our helpline and updated them regarding the scientific advice and to provide them with specific support. Our specially trained family liaison officers continue to support and update the families of the 35 deceased and we have also been in contact with a number of families regarding the ashes recovered from the premises. In addition, we have had a significant number of calls that relate to suspected financial and fraudulent activity. I have a dedicated specialist investigation team carrying out numerous inquiries and they are following up on various leads in relation to those financial investigations. If you have any concerns over funeral plans that you or a loved one may have taken out, in the first instance, please contact your insurance company to establish whether or not the policy is legitimate. If not, please report this matter to the police by calling 101 or via our Humberside Police website where your inquiry will be crimed and you'll be contacted subsequently by part of the investigation team. I can confirm that a man and woman still remain on police bail in relation to the investigation and that our extensive inquiries will continue. I would now like to hand you over to Julia Weldon from Hull City Council who will be able to provide you with further information. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Julia Wells and I'm Director of Public Health and Deputy... Well, we've just been listening to the police there giving this press conference in Hull on the status of this funeral directors, which uh, it, it, it seems there are actually more questions as a result of this press conference than answers, perhaps. Not everybody that has been recovered from this funeral directors has been identified. Mm. And they went on to say that they've been unable to attribute or identify some of the human ashes. Very difficult indeed to get the DNA information there. They've had 700 families that they've been in contact with who have raised concerns about this funeral director. I mean, this is 
Uh, quite incredible, mm. this story. Um, and we're going to be speaking to Anna Riley, who's been covering mm. this, and she's up in Hull. Um, ah, we've got Anna with us. Anna, thank you very much indeed, Anna Riley. Um, can you recap a little of what we just heard from the police there? Uh, yes, it's it's truly shocking by the sounds of it, what we've just heard. Um, the DNA uh, shows that they cannot identify um, the bodies of those people affected, um, which is a true blow for families. Um, the police said that they'd been in contact with 700 families as part of this um, and that they've got family liaison officers that are in touch with those families affected. And then we were just about to hear from the council, I believe, as well, um, to hear updates from them. But Yes, I mean, we've had scant information uh, on this case so far, so this seems to be the biggest update nearly one month on from when this investigation began. Um, at first, we heard... Um that it was over, uh, it was 35 bodies um, and a quantity of ashes that were removed from legacy funeral directors at their Hesel branch, uh, Hesel Road branch in Hull. Uh, they were also having investigations at their branch in Beverley and another branch in Anleby Road in Hull. Um, certainly an outpouring of grief from communities. I I'm sure there will be even more now. We've just heard that recent update, but families speaking to the press saying that they didn't know whether the ashes that they had been given were in fact the ashes of their family member who they believed had been put to rest. Uh, one woman telling the press as well that she believed that she had kissed an empty coffin. Um, floral tributes being laid following following the investigation that's, that's ongoing um, from, from the community as well. And as we heard there, two people arrested for it that are still out on bail as police investigations continue. But I'm sure much of that, that press um, conference that's still going on now will be the police really trying to reassure the public and trying to reach out to families and, and give them that reassurance. But, I mean, it, it's truly shocking what we've just heard and I'm sure I, my heartfelt sympathies and, and the channels will do to these families affected that are not only going through the loss of losing a loved one but then not knowing who the loved one is to be reunited with them. It's an absolutely tragic tale. Well, um, Anna Riley, thank you so much for recapping that, of course, hearing from the police there. That lack of identification. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 raise, it raises a question, actually, and it raises a horrible question. In what state were some of these bodies found? Yeah. And um, whether you can trust a service like a funeral director, you would suppose, wouldn't you? You'd yeah. assume that they were some of the most trustworthy people out there looking after bereaved families at their time of need. Um, and some of these families, it looks like they may never know, mm. from the sounds of it, they may never know whether the ashes they received were actually those of their loved ones or not. Now, we'll bring you updates from Anna as this story develops and if we hear any more from the council and the police. But shall we move on to something a little different? Let's, because British farmers are campaigning for a basic income in a bid to improve financial security within the farming sector. Yes, so before Brexit, farmers heavily relied on subsidies from the European Union, but now the government is having to replace these with some other schemes. Now, of course, farmers did want this replaced. The common agricultural policy was a bugbear of farmers the majority of whom voted to leave the EU. But according to a new report, these new systems won't plug a funding gap that's been left in this transition. Yes, I guess the question is, well, one of the questions is, how much money would a basic income be? Yes. And how costly would it be? But, of course, the criticism of the common agricultural policy is that money was given on the basis of how much land you yep. owed, not on the basis of what you produced. And the new system being brought in in different parts of the UK, they're doing it differently, very different in Wales, I must add. But in England, the system will be that if you produce more, do socially valuable things, you'll get more money. And if you just sit on the land, you won't. Whereas before, there was no incentive to produce Which makes food. sense. Which makes sense, in theory. GB News Northern Ireland reporter Doogie Beatty joins us now. Um, Doogie, do you think this idea of a basic income for farmers is actually a goer? No, I don't believe that that will be a goer. Farmers really need security because we need the security of food production. And back in 2021, uh, there was 
basically four bans put into place of how much money you would get under these new schemes. And in those bans was a lot of stuff about uh, um, environmental issues, etc. And over, in the first year of 2021, the basic income came down by 5%, the basic grant. Then it continued and continued. It's to end at the end of 24, 2024 this year. And it is already down 60% across that, that basic payment. Then you take into account that over the last 24 months, as I have been wittering on about in GB News, the input costs to farming have went up 35% for various reasons. First of all, fertiliser, environmental issues, and we haven't even started on, on some of the ammonia nitrates uh, and uh, methane taxes. So when we were renegotiating our way out of Brexit. We only came out of COVID in 2021. We were in the middle of that. The government were more interested in going getting trade deals around the world. And of course, when they did that with Australia, New Zealand, Pacific Rim, they also brought in cheap food, which they could then have a real impact on our farmers that are being asked to produce to a certain standard. Then we bring into it the green issues and as in Wales, 20% of your land has to be set aside for greening, the growing of trees. So the growing of trees is, is a perfect issue. What you get, many, many firms and airlines are now running around buying up agricultural land to plant trees to offset their carbon tax. Now that then drives the price of land up. So everything, farming in Britain is in the eye of a perfect storm and it's not much better across Europe. 40 per, or the farming in France, nearly 40% of their farmers are underneath the average wage. And this is because Europe at one time put in the same rules that would say do Greece as would say do Northern Ireland. That will never work because you have to farm to the climate. So what we are going to see is borders coming into place by the end of April, which will put more prices on goods coming in to Britain and our own farmers do not have the income to fill that supply chain. Well, thank you very much indeed, Doogie BT. Great to speak to you. Thank you for setting that all out for us. Now, this is a curious one. This, uh, this is uh, the words mother and father. Are they offensive? I don't think they're particularly offensive. I've never been offended by them. Are they offensive? Well, they could be listed as oppressive words. Me. Under a new inclusive language guide, guess where? <laughs> In Scotland, the home of free speech. Why is it all... Oh, good. Oh, oh. There are no words. There are no words. But we're going we're going to try. Is it all going too far? This inclusive language guide in Scotland. We'll be talking about that after this. Britain's newsroom. Weekday mornings from 9:30. Is it OK to call people fat? I won't call Bev fat because she isn't. She <laughs> won't call me fat because I'm not. But the fitness fanatic, Derek Evans, you might know him better as 90s icon, Mr Motivator, recently he's told a podcast, diabetes and diabetes have gone through the roof. And you should be able to call people fat. Well, he joins us now. Good morning, Derek. Good morning. Good morning. Great to see you. So I think what you're getting you. at is this idea that we've become so polite about weight that we're ignoring the elephant in the room. Um, if you'll forgive the <laughs> forgive the phraseology there, and actually, sure. sometimes you've got to be cruel to be kind. Well, actually, you know, this has been taken out of all context. I actually didn't say you're entitled to call people fat. What I did say is that in the 80s and 90s, I remember the way I got into television, there was a gentleman walking at reception while I was waiting for the people I was training. And for some reason, I got up and I prodded them in the belly. And I said to him, you need to deal with that. That was fat. We have a nation where obesity, diabetes is killing every one of us. Mm. And unless we take responsibility for our health, rather than waiting for government to do this, government to do that, it is our responsibility, right, to look after our independence and our health. And as we get older, it's even more critical, right? And that's why I'm here as an example saying to you, listen, I'm 71 years of age and movement is medicine. And you can't sit around watching television and not going out to the gym or wherever, you will never ever be able to look after your family and everything you've worked for, you will lose it. I've never seen a hearse 
I, sorry, a deposit account behind a hearse. Mm. I've ne no matter what you work for, the most important thing you can do with your life is every hour, do something active. Every hour. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good afternoon, Britain. Coming up to 10 to 3. Now, would you ever think that the words mother and father could be listed as, get this, not even offensive, but oppressive words. Oppressive. Oppressive. It's a loaded term. Well, now they have been, because uh, Scotland's International Development Alliance has released, drum roll, their inclusive language guide advising against the use of terms like mother and father, those bigoted words. And among the list of problematic terms, the guide also discourages words like girls, third world, and foreign aid. Sorry, the International Development uh, Fund in Scotland wants to not talk about foreign aid. That's literally their job. I guess they call it International Development Funds. It's too many syllables. Well, let's talk about that and all of the syllables are included above <laughs> with the political commentator and writer Emma Webb. Um, Emma, this, this is... <sighs> OK, why is it always Scotland? <laughs> Well, I think we've seen this with the Scottish hate crime bill as well. That there's been a real push in Scotland to to transform the country into a kind of progressive utopia. There's a very um, distinctive ideological line. The Scottish hate crime bill has come in to uphold what is essentially a new blasphemy law that prevents people from wrong speaking against that new progressive orthodoxy. Um, so I think this is part of the zeitgeist in Scotland, but it's also it's part of the zeitgeist in these sorts of organisations mm. generally. I mean, this is one more on the mountainous heap of language guides like this. If you remember, I think it was Peter, the animal organisation, also put out um, a similar kind of language guide. We've seen yeah. so many examples, and, and usually it's attacking words like mother and father or um, chest feeding instead of breastfeeding. It's attacking the gender binary. And in this instance, I think it's partly because part of this progressive ideology um, aims to dismantle the nuclear family. The nuclear family is regarded as something, as you know, all the things in society that are now regarded as structurally or systemically oppressive um, or racist or sexist or patriarchal. The nuclear family is always something that ideologues want to kind to try to destroy because it's one of the sort of foundational building mm. blocks of society. And actually, to answer what your question there, Emily, you asked what they want to call foreign aid instead. They want to call it social development finance. And the reason they state for this is because the language is paternalistic and, quote, implies an unequal power relationship marked by <laughs> altruism, which denies the unjust distribution of resources that defines that dynamic. Emma, it's That's interesting you say that because we were just talking about how um, a foreign court is considered by some as some kind of dog whistle. But um, Emma, this is quite progressive, though. You know, usually they only talk about the word mother. This time they're talking about the word father as being oppressive too you know this isn't just going after after women that makes a nice change surely it's very you to try and find a silver lining in things, Emily. Um, I think it's just as bad. They're attacking the nuclear family. And I, I think it's really, it's what, what strikes me as particularly um, egregious. It's not just that, obviously, there's a, ta a lot of taxpayer money going into this um, organisation. And, of course, the Taxpayers Alliance has already commented on this. I think that any organisation that does this kind of um, ideological 
push to control language and ultimately therefore to control thought. I think that um, they should be immediately stripped of their taxpayer funding. Um, but uh, it's it particularly egregious it, with respect to an international aid organization. There's something that's almost amusingly neo-colonial um, <laughs> about this in that you ca can't can really imagine somebody going to um, uh, uh, somebody in Africa, for example, um, maybe a, a, in an, another partnership aid organization and telling them, oh, no, sorry, we don't use the words mother, father, <laughs> girl. They're pushing a progressive Western um, ideological mm. orthodoxy um, onto their partners in, yeah. in other countries. And remember, as you I rightly think. say so often, these are funded by us. Yeah. These are funded by the yeah. taxpayers. It's, it's our money that's doing this stuff. Well, Emma Webb, really appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us here on the show. That's it, I'm afraid, for the programme. Uh, but it's Martin Daubney up next. Martin, what's coming up? Tom, I love that. Why is it always Scotland? You summed it all up. Super <laughs> of today, new soft sentence in laws. Why they are a thug's charter. The concept of equality before the law smashed to matchwood as we give passes to those who claim to be oppressed. Rishi says you'll leave the ECHR. Do you believe him? Well, I've had over 600 emails from you already, and many of you think there's more chance of visiting Santa. And also, have the terraces gone woke? Now people are getting banned from, from grounds just for shouting at each other. That's all come in, but first, it's your latest weather forecast. A brighter outlook with Box Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello again and welcome to the GB News forecast with the Met Office. Further rain arrives overnight. It's going to stay cold in the north and as the rain moves into Scotland, there will be some disruptive snow over the hills north of the central belt. A number of systems coming our way over the next few days. The next low brings spells of rain and hill snow across the UK. And then another low for the weekend, Storm Kathleen, named by Met Erin, because the strongest winds will be for the Republic of Ireland. But it will be blustery overnight, nevertheless, with some heavy rain in places. Those spells of rain particularly affecting northern and western parts of the country, although the far north of Scotland is staying clear of that, with a touch of frost in places. But it's across central Scotland where there's the risk of disruption as we start off Friday. Rain disruption for lower parts of the central belt and for higher parts of the central belt and into central Scotland the risk of some disruptive snow up to 10 centimetres or so above 300 metres could cause some issues first thing. That peters out through the day and it stays cold in northern Scotland but elsewhere it's a mild day, early rain clears to showers, some sunny spells in between the downpours with highs of 18 or even 19 Celsius towards the southeast. Another blustery day on Saturday. In fact, it becomes increasingly windy as heavy rain moves north across Scotland and Northern Ireland first thing, replaced by showers. Some sunshine in between the showers. The wind will be strong with the gusts of 50 to 70 miles an hour for Western Britain and Northern Ireland, but it will also be a warm wind, highs of 20 or 21 Celsius. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. Fred chance to win a prize worth over £20,000. Text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 
I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. A very good afternoon to you. It's 3 p.m. Welcome to the Martin Daubney Show on GB News. And we're broadcasting, of course, live from the heart of Westminster all across the UK. On today's show, is it time for more lenient sentences? Well, judges are being told to consider softer punishments for those who are from disadvantaged backgrounds. Has two-tier policing become a two-tier judiciary? And will this be a thug's charter? Next up, Sudak has claimed he's going to leave the ECHR. The Prime Minister threatens to quit the European Court of Human Rights over his Rwanda plans if the flights don't take off. But the big question is this. Do you believe a single word he says? I've had 600 comments on this so far. And let's just face it, people don't seem to trust Rishi on this whatsoever. Next up, a Labour supermajority surge. Well, a poll reveals that 11 Tory cabinet ministers will be wiped out at the next general election. And Starmer's party will win 400 seats. 75% of all people in the Commons could be Labour. And does that now make them simply unstoppable and as a Wrexham football fan is handed a three-year ban for shouting abuse at English fans which I thought was fair enough is a desire to crack down on hooliganism now a threat to free speech have the terraces gone woke and that's all coming in your next action-packed hour Welcome to the show. Always an absolute joy to have your company. We've got so much to sink our teeth into today. Top of the list. Do you believe Rishi Sunak when he says he would leave the European Court of Human Rights? Were the Rwanda flights to be grounded? I asked you this about an hour ago. Let's just say there's not a great deal of comfort out there for the Prime Minister. Empty words is what it seems to be. I will have a series of legal experts on the show over the next three hours pointing out the ECHR isn't the problem. The problem is politicians lacking the guts to actually stand up to the European Court of Human Rights. And we already could do that if we just cracked on. Get in touch with that. Um, email the usual ways, gbviews at gbnews.com. Plus, what about this two-tiered sentencing? Is it right that people from poor or disadvantaged background, and check this, those who claim to have experienced oppression, and we know where that's going, they could get softer sentencing, two-tier judiciary, the idea we're all equal before the law, kicked to Matchwood in the name of progressive politics. Is this creating a thug's charter? Get in touch. The usual ways, gbviews at gbnews.com. Let's kick off the show with your latest news headlines, and it's time for Sam Francis. Martin, thank you very much and good afternoon from the GB Newsroom. It's just after three o'clock and uh, we start this hour with some breaking news that's come into us in the last uh, half hour or so that the mastermind of an armed robbery 19 years ago that ended in a police officer being shot dead has today been found guilty of her murder. 
PC Sharon Beshinivsky was killed by Piran Ditta Khan in 2005. The 38-year-old died after interrupting a raid at a family-run travel agents in Bradford. And she had, at the time, only been an officer in the force for nine months. Khan flew to Pakistan two months after the murder and remained at large until he was arrested in 2020. He's the last of seven men who were involved in that robbery to be convicted. He was found guilty at Leeds Crown Court today and we understand will be sentenced at a later date. In other news, the Prime Minister says that Britain could pull out of the European Convention on Human Rights if it obstructs the government's Rwanda plan. Rishi Sunak says that controlling illegal migration is more important than membership in the ECHR and that he would not let what he called the foreign court interfere in sovereign matters. Labour, though, has accused the Prime Minister of trying to appease the hard right in the Conservative Party. More than 600 British legal experts, including three former Supreme Court judges, are calling on the UK to stop selling arms to Israel. They say there's a plausible risk that the weapons may be used to commit serious violations of international law and that the Prime Minister must change Britain's policy. We've heard this afternoon that Leicester City Council has said that sensitive information has been posted online by a known ransomware group after it was stolen from the council in a cyber attack. The local authority was the victim of a hack last month, forcing it to shut down its IT systems. It's confirmed that confidential documents have now been published by that group of hackers, including rent statements and ID, de ID details. The group is known to have attacked a number of other government, education and healthcare organisations. And the National Cyber Security Centre is now involved in that ongoing criminal investigation. British farmers are calling for a guaranteed basic income after post-Brexit arrangements left many worse off. At least 100 have joined a campaign group urging the government to help cover basic costs after the loss of subsidies from the European Union. Analysis last year by the organic farming group Riverford found that half of Britain's fruit and vegetable growers may go out of business within just a year. And it comes as suppliers are warning of higher prices and possible empty supermarket shelves due to a new post-Brexit border charge, which will be introduced at the end of this month. Judges have been told to consider more lenient sentences for offenders from either deprived or difficult backgrounds. The Sentencing Council, which sets guidelines for judges and magistrates, has for the first time outlined mitigating factors that it says courts should consider before handing down a sentence. Those factors include poverty, low education, discrimination and insecure housing. But critics say that the law should treat everyone equally, with Justice Secretary Alex Chalk describing the guidelines as patronising and, he says, inaccurate. The French president says that he has no doubt that Russia will target the Paris Olympics this summer, threatening the security of the Games. Emmanuel Macron was speaking during an event in Paris this afternoon for the inauguration of the new Olympics Aquatic Centre. Russian and Belarusian athletes are set to compete at the Games as so-called neutrals this year, amid tensions following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. To Taiwan now, where uh, dozens of people are still missing and ten people are now known to have died after a major earthquake there. People have been urged to keep clear of mountainous areas due to the risk of possible falling rocks following the quake. More than a thousand people have suffered injuries, with nervous residents experiencing more than 300 aftershocks. However, emergency workers have been commended for their quick response, with some shelters up in operation within just two hours of the major quake. Weather news and strong winds and heavy rain are set to hit parts of Britain this weekend. A storm Kathleen rolls in. It's the 11th named storm in just eight months. Gusts of up to 70 miles an hour are expected on Saturday along the west coast of England, with 50 mile an hour winds also expected in other areas. The Met Office is urging people to take care, with coastal areas also expected to see some large waves. And finally, before we head back to Martin in Westminster, the world's oldest man has died today. Just two months before, would you believe it, he could have celebrated his 115th birthday. Juan Vicente Perez was born in Venezuela in 1909, nearly 20 years before the first radio station started broadcasting there. Well, there have been six British monarchs during his long lifetime and 20 US presidents. His death was announced by the governor of the region where he lived, who described him as a humble, a hard-working and peaceful man. 
That's the latest from the newsroom for now. I'll be back in the next half hour. Until then, you can sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan the code on your screen or go to GB News Alerts uh, on our website. Now, though, it's back to Martin. Thank you, Sam. Right, loads to get stuck into today. Let's get cracking. And first topic is this. Judges have been told to consider more lenient sentences for offenders from deprived or difficult backgrounds. And it comes from the Sentencing Council, who are responsible for advising judges and magistrates across the land. And the guidelines on difficult and or deprived backgrounds state that these factors include poverty, low educational attainment, experience of discrimination and even insecure housing. But are these really valid reasons to get away with crimes? Well, I'm now joined by that man, Christopher Hope, <laughs> our political editor in the studio in Westminster. Chris, great to have you back in the studio. Um, surely the concept of equality before the law is sacrosanct to any functioning democracy, the idea that people might get soft-soaping if they come from a disadvantaged background, that runs contra to what we all understand to be true and proper. Of course, everyone is equal. Hi, Martin. Before the law, everyone is equal, but equally, you can allow for mitigating factors which may have meant that someone went down a, to a different, a, a more criminal path in their lives, and that's what they're looking at here. It's, it's called the Sentencing Council. It sets a, a, um, strategy and guidance for judges to allow them to ensure that they're jailing the right people. Uh, the, rule, the guidance that came out came out on Monday um, made clear that leading, some of the leading sentences for, for offenders from deprived or difficult backgrounds should be allowed to understand the, the, why are they making the, those choices in, in their lives. They're looking at personal backgrounds, poverty, low educational attainment, experience of discrimination, insecure housing. Came in on Monday, the, the, the Alex Shaw, who's the Justice Secretary, clearly is not happy about it, but he can't do much about it. For me, it's the judges taking control of a situation where the jails in England and Wales are 98% full. Um, they need to act to make sure that the jails aren't full to bursting, so they're doing their own way by bringing their own, uh, their own guidance here. We do have a sentencing bill proposed in last November's um, King's speech that said that no-one will be jailed for less than a year. We're going to grasp the nettle, to quote the government at the time. Well, it's been grasped and nothing's happened, because as things stand, as many as 40-odd Tory MPs, led by Swella Braveman, yep, mm. that's her again, she wants to amend that, that, those measures so it's much harder to release people and not jail them for less than a year. The problem is there aren't enough prisons spaces and for me the judges are getting on with dealing with that crisis here's what i think is going to happen are you going to tell me yeah i think <laughs> lawyers will look at this and they'll be licking their lips to prove discrimination even to concoct it or to give it some top spin experience of discrimination straight away i was saying okay my client is from a bane background that'll tick a box my my client was on free school meals that'll tick a box for me this represents a race to the bottom it, mm. it represents a quest for victimhood. It represents, I think, a thug's charter. Because what if you live in the same neighbourhood as these people and you also experience the same disadvantages, but you're the one having your house robbed? And you're seeing those people getting soft soap by the judges. And does it mean that law-abiding, hard-working, middle-class taxpayers, they'll get their book thrown at them? This is guidance for judges. It's not for lawyers to try and use to support their case. Lawyers might be aware of the broad ballpark in terms of, of guidance and support, but it's up to judges to interpret what they see and weigh up the impact on maybe uh, a victim living close to a, a thug, as you describe, or someone who's been uh, in charge for, for, for mugging, whatever it might be, on, on trial for mugging. It's, it's work out where they are. Is it appropriate to jail that person, putting new orders in to keep them away from them? It's a way, I think, of dealing with a problem of overcrowded jails. Um, and it was also allowing maybe for, if you are, if you're from a black or Asian minority ethnic background, and why can't can't you say, well, I've, 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 I've been arrested more than I might if I was white, and therefore uh, that may have meant I was more angry with the police, you know, a, 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 a bearing on, on how you're, you're behaving. You don't agree with me, no, too. No, no I, I actually think that you're proving my point, but by, by, by allowing the, the, um, the kind of osmosis, the taking on board of oppression as a way of 
uh, mitigating uh, against a, a sentence. But it has happened, hasn't it? I mean, the, some of this has happened, this discrimination against people has forced them down maybe some more violent path they might have taken if they hadn't been. We could just build more jails, but we have to move on. And <laughs> that topic is Rishi Sunak rattling his sabre, saying yes. if the flights don't take off for a while, which, by the way, you've still got a single pint of beer, which I think remains it's safe. safe. It's I safe. I think it remains safe. A single pint of beer. If that pint of beer were to touch the Prime Minister's lips, <laughs> then he'd be calling the boys at the ECHR threatening to pull out. He Did doesn't drink, of course, so a pint of lemonade for him, a pint of beer for me. Uh, it was a bet, wasn't it? We yes. made the bet, I think, in, in September last year. Uh, I, I, in my defence, maybe the May election, it would have been safe. I'm not yeah. sure what's so safe for the November election. He told Sun viewers, Sun newspaper viewers on YouTube last night, the Prime Minister, I do believe that border security and making sure that we can control illegal migration is more important than membership of our foreign court because, it, because it's fundamental to our sovereignty as a country. The foreign court is European Court of Human Rights. That's the court with 40 or so judges, some of whom are British, which has ruled to stop flight, um, uh, uh, people arriving here illegally um, by boat, being taken out of this country and flown to Rwanda. That battle starts again, I expect, mm. after April the 18th, when I expect the Rwanda bill to become a law, and then the judges, of the, the courts when they, and the lawyers will get stuck into it. Do you think this is kite flying? It's a nice bit of red meat to throw to, to, throw to the red wall. Oh, great, he's talking tough. It will horrify, of course, the, the Shire Tories. Um, but is it just performative? Do you think there's any actual appetite well, if you ask to leave 10, the ECHR? Ask number 10 what they meant by it. And I did, did you for GB News today. Number 10 said that the PM is saying if it came to it, if it came to it, and the EA, ECHR was a block on Rwanda, we would consider leaving. Consider yes. being the opposite so if word. And consider there's two conditionals in that sentence. So I think clearly he is saying perhaps what GB News viewers want to hear and listeners and Sun readers and Sun viewers. But would that would he actually go and do that? Not everyone agrees with him. Jonathan Gullis, by the way, the, the deputy chairman of the party, yep. he said that this means that Britain will quit the ECHR if that's what it takes to stop the small boats. Sunak says so, uh, tells Sun readers clearly those on the right of the party are seeing this as a commitment, but that isn't maybe there if you talk to number ten. And there's that small but important word. If and consider, quite right. So, I mean, clearly, were we to fight the election, election on ECHR withdrawal as a black and white issue, many toys wouldn't be, wouldn't be uh, campaigning for him. Super great stuff. Great to have you back in the studio, Chopper, and we'll see you, of course, throughout the show. Well, joining me now is James Treadwell. He's a professor of criminology at Staffordshire University, and we're going to go back to our top story there, and that is the reviewing of the Sentencing Council recommendations. James, what do you make of this? You've probably just heard our conversation here. I believe it creates two tiers before the law. I think it creates the opportunity for phony oppression, for concocting stories to get off jail. What's your take? I think there's some truth in that, Martin, and I think Christopher was right in many ways that what in effect we're having here, and, and it's odd from the Sentencing Council, which is supposed to largely remain sort of apolitical, that, that they're in effect giving the government a get out of jail free card here because the government haven't got enough jail places. In effect, this has been a crisis that's been coming for a very, very long time. Our prison population is at a record high. We're running out of prison capacity. And quite simply, even if people deserve to go to jail and, 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 and merit those sentences, we're, we're having to find ways to release them early, um, to, to stop them from, from being put into prison custody. Um, it's incredibly disingenuous to, to voters at the same time to continually say that, in effect, you're being tough on crime because in all sorts of other areas, we're not being tough on crime at all. Let's also think about uh, policing and the direction that policing is taken. The clear up rates for crime are absolutely abysmal. There are activities and criminal activities that are largely now decriminalised in effect that, you know, uh, where the law simply isn't enforced. And people, I think, are rightly going to see it and think, what on earth is going on in the criminal justice system? And uh, for all the kind of rhetoric from both sides politically, um, there's very little effectively being done in, in terms of bringing forward solutions or looking at how we've got into the situation that we're in.
James, I think you absolutely got to the, the cusp of this in one sentence, giving the government a get out of jail card. In fact, our political editor for um, Chris Hope nodded profusely. He's got a question for you. Uh, James Treadwell, yeah, I'm in the studio here with Martin. Uh, just to ask you, to what extent do you think judges are going ahead of the politics? We've had this sentencing bill on the, on the ready to go since the King's speech in November. It's now stuck in Downing Street, as we understand it, because it's got dozens of Tory MPs trying to make it so you can't release uh, cr criminals after what uh, uh, for, for, you can jail them for, for, for less than a year. Are judges here going ahead of the politics? They're saying, let's get on with this. We can't jail everyone. Let's find reasons not to jail some criminals. I think that message is perhaps being picked up a little bit in, in Crown Courts, although there is more restriction in Crown Courts. The interesting thing in some ways is if you look at what the government did, they, they gave magistrates, in particular, the power to, to sentence people to an, an extended period of prison custody, sentences up to 12 months, and gradually they've eroded those powers and taken mm. them back as well. So, and, and you've got to remember that the, ma the majority of those who are processed through our criminal courts aren't processed through our Crown Courts. Our crown Courts with judges tend to set, take the most serious uh, offenders. The, there's a huge backlog in the Crown Courts as it is. Very often they're dealing with very, very serious offences where when it comes to conviction, there is no uh, th there is no debate really about where individuals are going to go. Those who are going to be convicted in the Old Bailey today are by and large likely to go to prison and custody. The interesting thing is what's happening in the magistrates' courts. And I think there, the, 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 the guidance from the Sentencing Council is much more likely to be taken on board and used. And in effect, th though, those are the courts that deal with the vast majority, the vast tranche of criminal behaviour that we see, criminal damage, damage to people's cars. People, I, I, just before I came to do this interview, I walked around an affluent area in Birmingham. I saw three people riding down the street on motorbikes without mo motorcycle helmets. It happens so frequent, frequently and regularly nowadays because the roads aren't policed. And, and my final point would be, you know, lots of people will say that there is no, you know, there's no evidence deterrence works. But in effect, when you have a criminal justice system that, 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 that isn't operating, that isn't passing any sort of sanction, where people have no fear of apprehension and prosecution, largely because it simply doesn't happen very frequently anymore, or if it does, it's so delayed into the future, you know, that then you see many of these kind of low-level crimes that, mm. that blight communities, in effect, mm. play out over and over again. And just one final thing to say, which Martin was absolutely right about and doesn't get said enough. The real impact of this is not felt in affluent middle-class communities. It's felt in the poorest and most impoverished communities, largely in urban city centres, where the victims of the offenders look exactly the same as the offenders themselves, but very often don't turn to crime. The communities that are blighted by antisocial behaviour are the poorest communities. They, they are the ones with the, the greatest disadvantages at the moment already, the ones that already suffer high levels of deprivation. But of course, not everybody in those communities, many of them lead very legitimate law-abiding lives, and they want to see something done about the individuals that blight their lives. And what's coming from on high, from the criminal justice system, doesn't seem to be effective, and that's creating political apathy, and people are losing faith. Well, James, whatever coffee you're drinking, I'd love one of them. You've been absolutely <laughs> bang on, mate. Fantastic stuff. James Treadwell, Professor of Criminology at Staffordshire University. And Chris, I reckon those lads on the motorbikes will probably claim they were oppressed at school and forced once to wear a hat. <laughs> and that's why they'd be trying to get off. That's what I think the kind of chaos will be created by this sort of system. What a cracking start to the show. Now, we'll have lots more on that story throughout the rest of the show. And there's plenty of coverage on our website, gbnews.com. And you've helped to make it the fastest growing national news website in the can country. So thank you very much indeed. Now brace yourselves because it's our biggest giveaway of the year so far. Your chance to win a £10,000 Greek cruise for two, 10 grand in cool, hard, tax-free cash and a whole host of luxury travel gifts to go on top of that. Your 2025 holiday could be on us here at GB News and here's all the details that you need to enter.
you could win our biggest prize giveaway so far. First, there's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel gifts. For a chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE19 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Great stuff. Well, coming up, as Sunak, Rishi Sunak signals his biggest hint yet. He's prepared to withdraw from the ECHR over the Rwanda plan. Is the foreign court just a big red herring? <laughs> I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel.